What makes Phil Hellmuth so much better at poker than you? I That's where you're six. just fucking wrong. Okay. Wrong. Perfect. That's, you're, you're just fit, wrong about You fit it right That's, with everyone else. Just got to finish my breakfast real quick. I, you know how hard it is to win tournaments. He doesn't understand. Like, he doesn't think in terms of modern poker theory or like... I had a timing tell in that hand, by the way. Was yeah. the one where you misclicked and fucking won with Jack High? Mike Postle stared at his crotch for two years and won a quarter million dollars off of people at 2-5. I'm getting cock fucked. And never good. No one, no one wants to get cock fucked. What's up, guys? Doug Polk here, and welcome back to another episode of the Doug Polk Podcast. Today, we are joined by a guest that many of you probably would not have expected to be on here. We're talking about Daniel Negron, who joins us to talk about his recent heads-up matches with Phil Helmuth, some of the hands that he played there. We're also going to talk about his recent victory in the Poker Go Open Cup. We're also going to talk about who he thinks is the best tournament poker player today. And then we're going to talk World Series of Poker and a few other subjects as well. And of course, going to be talking a little bit about the match that we played versus each other. What should be an exciting one. But before we jump into that talk, I want to quickly let you know that in just a couple of weeks here, my module will be released going through all of my hands. I played versus Daniel Negreanu. All of the biggest pots that did not go to showdown will be released. You can see them over on Upswing Poker in the Upswing Poker Lab. I'm going to run you through some sims on those hands, talk about mistakes that I made or some hands that I played well. And you're also going to get to see some of the biggest, actually, you're going to get to see the biggest bluffs that I ran in the challenge, as well as some of the value bets that unfortunately did not get paid. We're also going to look at just the biggest pots in general, and we're going to be recapping some of the stats. I'm going to show you my HUD, as well as the way that I played for the match, some things I could have improved on. Should be a fun one. It's three to four hours, and it will be released in early August. So if you don't want to miss that, head over to upswingpoker.com and sign up for the Upswing Lab. I'll see you guys in there. Okay, without without further ado, let's jump into my conversation with Daniel Negreanu. What's up, guys? Doug Polk here, and today we are joined by a very special guest. A guest I think many people would have thought would never be on this podcast, yet here we are. We are joined by recent Poker Go Cup champion, Daniel Negreanu. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for, thanks for having me. I mean, I, I just got to finish my breakfast real quick because I a little more. Oh, <laughs> I want to thank nice. you for this. I want to thank you especially for this. Oh, nice. It's like it remind you know when Michael Jordan, you watch the Last Dance, right? Of course, great. You kind of love and like there's yeah. all these videos because I go on the YouTube rabbit hole and there's all these videos of Michael Jordan saying, "I took that personal." <laughs> so like it is pretty epic that right after you made that video, which really just shows, you know the streak i don't i don't even think because i watched the clip i didn't think it was you were like shitting on me it was just the fucking weird epic run yeah i think moving forward with just like the way that we talk to each other and stuff i think we just got to shoot it straight if something happens and we want to talk about it we shoot it straight i i it's not no personal attacks anymore but if you go on an eight-year second place run that's something i feel like i have to talk about that's newsworthy right what is that but i okay so what i know what in the thumbnail it says wtf like 12 million dollar downswing like what did they what do they mean by that like That's the feet. difference between first and second in all those. Oh, tournaments. okay. Yeah. So I see. So basically, so like, cause I won about 10 million and I'm like, wait a minute, I'm not on a 12 million. So basically I would have won 22 if I'd won all those. Okay. So it basically was like, if you thought about all your heads up matches, at the end of these tournaments as, as individual games, it would right. be a $12 million loss over. It, it was, it was ambitious. It was <laughs> Th Th Thomas's work. Of course. Thomas's okay. Work. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, though, I, I, I do have to say, if you had asked people two years ago, least likely podcast duo, I think it would be us, right? I, I, I uh, unless it was like with, an, with a moderator, with a mic cut off where you got 60 seconds and I got 60 seconds and we had prepared freaking notes. That would be yeah. about it. Discussing rake. Like, is oh, it God. better or not? <laughs> I wasn't going to say the R word, you know, that's... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's on you. No, anyway, so uh, thank you for coming on. I'm do glad. I, I am glad that we have managed to kind of get past that, and uh, I think things are in a good place now. And I think it's, I think it's good for poker. We had our match, and that we have this kind of relationship moving forward. I, I'm, I'm thankful to have you on today. Well, yeah, no, it's good. It's one of those things. I said it, you know, you interviewed it a while ago. It's kind of like one of those things where two people are like fighting. It's like let's just get in the ring, which in our world the ring is like poker. Go balls to the wall, and when it's over, you're like, all right respect you know you made it to the end and like you know and i, I yeah i'm oh, sorry that's okay. i totally agree and a lot of people they're like yeah Doug, talk some shit 
what shit do I talk at this point? The guy's playing me 200 for and heads up. You just shot, talk shit on the side during it. You kind well, of- it's also awkward to talk shit when like you're the favorite and I acknowledged as much. You know, it wasn't a case where I'm like, I'm better than you. And like, no, I'm better than you. I'm like, yeah. no, you're definitely better, but I'm going to do my best to try to close the gap. I mean, it wasn't, yeah. so it's, it's, it's hard. It would be really hard for you to come from that place and talk trash. Like, yeah, no kidding. It would be like fighting, like Muggsy Bogues versus Shaquille O'Neal and Shaq being like, I'm going to take you, son. Well, maybe not that extreme because I'm better than you. <laughs> Muggsy fair. was really good for a short guy. Yeah. No, it's exactly like it, it, you're basically at, at that point, you just have to put up, you know, you just have to show that you, know, you can play. But um, anyway, so now that we have the pleasantries exchanged, what makes Phil Hellmuth so much better at poker than you? <laughs> I will say this about Phil, right? One thing about Phil is he tries, he tries really, really hard. Like he's always intensely like involved and like he, he cares so much. Like he emotionally feels everything. So if the match isn't going his way, you see it on his face, you see it in his energy. And he will go to this other gear to try something different if it's not working, right? So he's obviously not somebody that is playing anywhere near what, like, would be considered, you know, game theory optimal or whatever. He does his own thing, which is completely exploitative. I remember the first time I told him that because I, I said, like, I was like, you play exploitative. And he's like, no, no, no. He's like, I, he literally said this. We were about to do the commentary on the break desk, and I couldn't stop laughing. He told me he invented GTO. <laughs> and I explained to him, I was like, no, no, Phil, this isn't an insult. It's not an insult what I'm saying to you. You're very good exploitative player and have been, and you, you know, take advantage of that. But you don't play GTO. That's, you know, the robot thing. And he's like, no, no, I invented it. And I was like, okay, well, yeah, no, I don't think so. There, there's a, his, yeah, some of his exploits, um, especially, especially against weaker players, I think uh, can be very, very effective in tournament formats. Like deep stack, none of his stuff really works. It's just punting. You know, it's just really bad to be limping 500 big lines deep every hand. It's not a thing. People don't realize this, but Phil Helmuth actually, when I when I said I'd play him heads up, he messaged me with his own his own version of what a challenge would look like. And he said, here are the rules, Doug. One table. I'm going to limp almost every hand. We're going to play for $20,000. And I want you to put up $20 million on the side. <laughs> that was that was his that was his his, his oh. he gets 20 to one, too. So it's his million to my 20 million. And he said, of course, his friends like, like Shamath would be, would have a piece like Phil, you can't even avoid bragging about your friend's names in, in this heads up challenge. It's, so funny, you say that. it's so funny you say that because about five years ago, he offered me a bet and I was willing to post, I, I was, I had to post $10 million, kind of like yours. Right. But was it, what for him, he said this, the same thing he said, but it has to be a hundred percent your money. Okay. But I was like, well, what about you? He's like, no, I'm going to get a free roll. I'm like, So it matters to you. Like if other people want a piece of this bet, I can't sell like 500K or whatever. He's like, nope, has to be your money. He basically sets it up in ways where like it would be impossible for you to actually take on the bet. Right, exactly. There's no way, I, especially in a format like that. So I have to put up 100 buy-ins on the side, or is it 1,000? Whatever the number is, I have to put up an absurd number of buy-ins on the side and then one table you with you limping. I, that's a- you can't sell pieces. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Not loud. Absolutely ridiculous. But what? So what happened in that match? And let me actually kind of set the table here for some of our listeners. So, if you guys aren't familiar with the format, uh, it's called the duel. It is a essentially a series of heads up and go challenges where, when two people play, the loser has the option to then challenge them again up to I believe three matches in total. The starting buy-in is a fifty thousand dollar buy-in, and if the loser wants to uh, challenge them. Or, rem- or get a rematch, then they have to put up the current prize pool. So let's say that it's 50,000, you lose, now it's 100,000, they have to match 100,000. And then if they lose that, it's 200,000. So I believe, Phil, is this correct, Daniel? I, I think this the stakes work something like this. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Basically, yeah, okay. exactly as you said. And the person who, like, so Phil can't cash out until three rounds have been completed. And then he can cash out and go back to 50K. Okay, cool. So essentially by the end of it, Phil had played, you guys had played a 50K heads up to go, 100K heads up to go, and a 200K heads up to go. So the stakes are escalating. And then by the third round, um, you're in for 200K yourself. And he's obviously playing with the pool of money that's already in there. So, you know, the stakes got reasonably big here by the end, but you actually also, to my understanding, had a lot of side bets going on this match. I saw a lot of people discussing the side bets. I, I didn't end up betting. Um, I, I thought that the line seemed a little bit weird to me, though. I saw it move around a bit in, in between the roughly U minus 125 to minus 150 range. I'm not sure kind of where it went down at, on different matches. I'm sure it changed over time. But 
can you really have that kind of edge in a format that's basically just a heads up sit and go? What were your thoughts on that line? And uh, if you, you know, if you can grace with how much you bet on yourself, that would be fun too. Yeah. So like a lot, there's a lot, a lot packaged in there. Number one, me betting on myself, I laid minus 150 and I still think the price is fine, but actually betting it uh, really, it affected a lot of the ways that I played the match in some spots. Right. So like if you're laying minus 150 and you have a spot where you're like, you know, you, you feel like you're 55, 45 for all of it. You're like, well, that's not good. <laughs> Cause that's like, that's losing. Right. So it, like in the, and I'll explain how all three matches went because they were very different. But like in the first match, I had him down 97 to three, right? And he had like 3K left and then, you know, went on a crazy tear. But part of what I did was like, I went in going like, I'm just never going to call him. So like I overfolded like crazy the entire match. And uh, there was times where I could have just like tried to put him away and I chose to avoid those. I was thinking in the mindset of like laying a big price. Now it is a very big price. The reason I laid it was because the way the structures was set up was it was really, really deep for like about three hours. So I felt like, and this held true, you know, during that period, I would get about a two to one chip lead anyway, right? Because it's really, really hard to lose. It's very hard to lose against a guy who's like 500 big lines deep, who's limping every button, like 90%, and you're just, you know, making it two and a half X or something like that. That alone, like, is likely to get you a, a lead, just doing nothing but that, right? So I felt like when crunch time came and the blinds were going to escalate, that I would have about a two to one chip lead pretty close. And I did for almost all of them. So I felt like the line was fine, but you know, having said that, if I were to do it again, I would avoid laying the price because if I could play them a hundred matches, you know, and lay minus 150 and say that I'm going to win like 60 out of 40, I would do that. Right. Problem is it's three and it's only three and there's other, other pressure. Plus you got all these side bets and stuff like that. So it definitely affected me in some spots in terms of uh, how I approached like close marginal spots. And I know that we got a couple of the hands that you wanted to bring up and they're perfect examples of it. Yeah. When you look at the, the math on it, let's say that uh, Helmuth jams, if you have a call that's 40, sorry, 57% to win, you actually can't take it because then you're taking a loss on the side bets because you need 58% roughly. I don't know the exact break even point, but something like that to be able to, to call profitably. And in, in heads up sit and goes, that could put you in some really terrible spots when you get shallow stacked because now you kind of can't make the play that you sort of need to make. You could probably still do some of the jamming and bluffing. I think versus Phil Helmuth, that's probably going to be pretty good no matter what. Um, but there's almost ICM considerations in a way. It's kind of similar in, in an aspect where now you not only have to think about, am I making this plus chip EV play, but am I also making a dollar plus EV play considering all of these side bets? You know, I so I have no doubt at the deeper stacks, you're crushing him, right? But the problem is, well, the way the heads up sitting goes work is so let's say you're winning at 20 big blinds per hundred when the, the blinds are really small, that might still be less chips than if you're winning at three big blinds per hundred when the blinds are big, because in terms of just total chip number, um, you might actually be winning at a smaller rate. You know what I'm saying? Basically as the blinds, as the blinds escalate, your ability to have edge is just so small. Do, do you worry about giving, giving a betting on yourself at odds like that? It's just, it's just hard to cover that much ground in a heads up sitting go. I mean, I played Phil in a heads up sit and go, he beat me. You know, I, I know what this is like firsthand. It just seems kind of hard to get that much of an edge. Why were you so confident at the minus 150? Well, I was expect I was especially confident in the first one, right? Like the first one, I felt like I would have the biggest edge because he wouldn't know what I was going to do to him, right? So as you know, like when it comes to game theory, right? If somebody under bluffs at all, even a little bit, if you just fold every single time, you're printing EV, like 100%. And there's no question that going into the match, we all knew Phil way under bluffs in all these significant spots on turn and river, right? So I felt like I was going to massively exploit that. And I did in the first match by overfolding like crazy. You, and, you posted your win rate, right? It was 20 big blinds per hundred yeah. or something. Okay. It was 20 big blinds per hundred in both actually the first two matches. I didn't do the third one because I'm over it. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so I was going to massively overfold. So I felt like my edge in that one was big. And it really worked exactly as I said. Like I grinded him all the way to a 97 to three lead without really any significant risk at all. It was just an easy glide, right? Then going into the second match, I assumed he's going to make adjustments. One of those adjustments had to be more aggression. What I expected him to do was up his aggression pre-flop with his, like, you know, he does this thing where his three betting range is like, you know, aces, kings, queens, ace, king, or 10-6 offsuit. 
king three off. Like he does not three bet jacks tens. He doesn't three bet jacks tens nines. He does not three bet pocket bears. He does not three bet very often with like a nine ten suited hands that play well post. It's about as polar as possible, right? So I expected him to up his aggression there. What I didn't expect him to do, which I give him credit for, was um, with his sizing on turn and river, be bluffing at all, right? But he was. He started to bluff there in some spots. He made one really crazy bluff in the second match. It was so bonkers. Like we got to tell. I got to tell you this one. Tell the hand, yeah. So I raised the button with nine, seven of diamonds. Uh, I think we're playing one and two blinds. So I make it 4K. He makes it 13, or th I think 13K. Uh, I call. It comes king, six, six, two spades, one diamond. So I have a lot of backdoor stuff. He bets flop, almost like 40%. I think. I called. The turn was the eight of diamonds. So now I have like everything. Now he bombs the turn, putting in like, he put in like, more than half his stack. So he put in like 65% of his stack, right? But I'm like, I'm getting a good price. So I call, the river's the nine of spades, okay? So I make nines, he jams, like his, and I'm like, I've obviously fold. I'm not ever calling there because I beat nothing and I'm at the absolute bottom of my range. And he had the 10 deuce of diamonds. He, he just, bought, wow. it's like, he wouldn't understand this, but like he had probably one of the worst hands to bluff with because he, he had the 10 of diamonds. Of course, yeah. two, Which is exactly the kind of hand that he needs me to have, right? To that, that, well, that, yeah, I mean, the, the deuce is pretty irrelevant, but the ten of right. diamonds is, is may, diamonds. maybe maybe the worst card. I mean, it's up there. It's yeah, one of the worst right? cards. Yeah, because like when you think of my range that gets to that river, it's like a king, it's a six, and it's spades, and then it's a small amount of like diamonds that are like that. And I, and I happen to have that. But it, yeah, yeah. everyone's like, "Why didn't you call?" I'm like, "Why would? How can I call with the nine there? It's insane." That's a, it's a tough spot there. Um, it gets a little weird when the remaining bet is so small relative to the pot. Sometimes you just have to, you just have to call even though it sucks because your odds are just so good to win. And if he does show up with the random ten deuce, um, you know, obviously the the call becomes a good amount better. But it also there could be a weird thing that happens there where it, because he bet the flop bigger, it's less bad to have the ten of diamonds because the smaller he bets, the more ten of diamonds you have it should float. You know. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if that's happening here or not. I, I'm probably overanalyzing. Or I am overanalyzing what was going on with Phil's thought process there. But, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's some kind of cool considerations for that hand. But, yeah, I, I think, like, Phil Phil is absolutely willing to go for it, right? He is. He's he's willing to go for it. But it's, it's, it's kind of, like, almost more old-school logic. It's, like, selective aggression. Is this the time? Is this the spot? Do I think... And it's, it's not, what are my buffs supposed to be on this board? What are my buffs supposed to be on this board? It's, this is the time I have either a read or it's, it, I haven't made a move in a while. I, I think that it's kind of, it's kind of, would you but say that that's It's funny fair? you say that about the read thing because, so he laid down in the third match. We're like, I don't know, 400 big blinds deep. He limped the button with ace, jack of spades. I seven X'd it because I was using a mixed strategy of three X and seven X. I seven X'd it. With You're ace welcome, by the way. I think I, I prepped you for that, right? I'm, I, you know what's so funny? I was talking to my guys. Yeah, you did. But I literally thought to myself before we looked at it, I was like, I think 7X is a thing. I really did. And then we looked at it and like, actually, yeah, you can either go with a 4X or a 3.7. And, you know, it, it bear true. But I just instinctively kind of knew that. But anyway, what he said was, because everyone's like, well, because he limp folded the ace jack of spades. Okay. And then he said there was two reasons. And his first reason is just like, exactly what you're saying. He's like, he saw me limp with the King 10 suited and I was able, and I called the seven X. So now I know he's clever and I know that now he's going to have it this time. Except the fact is I was 100% completely randomizing 100% using a strat, you know, like one of my randomization tactics. Sure. Yeah. I was hundred percent random, but he's like, aha, because he saw this, he saw this. And that's one of the dangers. Like, and I guess it's a poker lesson that I'm sure you guys talk about when you level yourself into thinking this means that right when you play against somebody who's using you know a balanced theory of randomization if you see three times in a row they're like you know that they they played a hand a certain way and you start to think aha that means he's going to switch to this to this it's like actually no he's just going to be balanced because he's randomized and maybe this is one of the reasons why i think in some of these large scale tournaments that you talked about earlier why his results have been pretty good we actually we did an article um at upswing where we went through all of Phil's runs and his caches and we looked at his ROI and it actually was really impressive. So we posted it. And of course, Phil's retweeting it and talking about it. Who would have thought Phil would have enjoyed that? I, not, yeah. not me. Um, but anyway, so it's actually really impressive in some of these huge fields, the way that he's able to, to 
you know, navigate them and his results in them. And part of that might be the weaker a player is, the more they do kind of fall into that. I think if a weak, if a weak player three bets you twice and then they throw at you again, I don't think weak players are are just thinking, I'm randomizing an optimal three-bit range here. They're thinking, oh, this guy's going to get upset. He's going to feel like I'm pushing him around. He's going to fight back, and now I've got aces. And so I think maybe maybe one of the reasons why Phil has been so successful in all of the smaller stakes tournaments is because of that, and maybe that's why he struggles in some of the higher stakes events. No question about it. Yeah, like it's pattern recognition, right? And like, right. especially like in the era that he grew up, because I grew up somewhat in it, you know, like in the late 90s and early 2000s, people just played hands pre- quite predictably in a lot of spots. Like, I could play a lot of, lot of suited connectors, you know, ooh, the six, four suits. I could play those hands because people played their hands so honest on the turn, right? So when you, when they do that, you can like, so for example, if they three bet you and it was like ace king or a big pair, right? As simplistic as that. If they bet the flop, they'll do that with ace king, like if they unimproved. But if you call, they would only continue if they actually had the pair and they would check the ace king. I mean, like that's a very simplistic version of it, but like, Phil was obviously very good at exploiting that because it's very easy to do so once you, you know, you have uh, instincts. The, the struggle he'll face, of course, is when he starts playing, you know, and he, I offered him this bet. Oh, look, I have to tell you about this text. This is too funny. So I offered Phil this bet where I'm going to lay 400K to his 200K. He just got to play the Aria 25Ks, right? 50 of them. He can choose 50 entries or 50 bullets, however he wants. I love this. All he's got to do is show an ROI profit. That's it. One dollar, you know, one dollar ROI profit. He wins the bet. So he texts me because the uh, recently we had the poker go coming up the cup and he was gonna, he texts me and I should read it verbatim. He basically said, "Hey, I just want to. I was thinking about coming down to play the 10k, but I want to make sure that if that I'm not ready to make the bet yet, but I want to make sure that if I win it, that the bet's still on, right? <laughs> like he oh. was afraid that if he comes down there, blasts through the 10k and wins it, that I'd be like, no way, Phil, no way, I'm off. I can't do the bet anymore." <laughs> unbelievable because yeah. you would be you would be shaking you'd be shaking yeah. in your boots if he if yeah, he won that if he won 10k i mean oh my god <laughs> what are wow. the chances that, i mean you know how hard it is to win tournaments <laughs> it is, it is. Uh, that bet, i think that bet is actually more plus ev than people realize because like the, if you you don't play tournaments as much but you understand the concept that right like really good players over 50 50 event samples are generally going to be losing period because you know, it's a short, it's a short sample. And the way tournaments are structured is like when you win, you win big, you know, in the top three spots, right. but, more, but more usually you're like stuck, right. You know, if you're only cashing 15 to 20% of the time. Yeah. So it could just be a, a good bet, you know, sort of, even if he was winning in these tournaments, but the fact that he's not winning makes it an especially good bet. Yeah. So uh, and it, there is, a, there is a significant difference in my opinion, between the 10 Ks and the 25 like there is a much wider group of players that will jump into the 10 Ks. And then as the tournaments progress, you see the 25 Ks, you see a lot of those like peripheral players kind of like, you know, step out and you see like more of like the Jake Schindlers who, in my opinion, you know, he's, he's, the, he's the, he's the number one guy right now, in my opinion. Um, and he's, you know, he's the guy that's going to skip the 10 Ks and show up for the 25 Ks. I've played a bunch of the 25 Ks and I think anytime I saw it was 10 K, I didn't even show up. So I know exactly what you're saying in terms of those tournaments. What makes you say that about Jake? I, I, I want to get back to a couple of these uh, dual hands, but we can talk about Jake Schindler for a moment. What makes you think that he's so good? What makes him well, the best? I've, I've been saying this and it's so funny because I came third in one and Jake won and everyone's like, you know, and then I, I tweeted out something about Jake and everyone's like, oh yeah, because you lost to him. He's best. I've been saying it for, for several years, actually. I think he combines, you know, all the attributes. He studies really, really hard. You know, studies really hard. I rarely see him make mistakes. I actually... When I was working on my own tournament game, like I watched tons of footage of just his hands because I had somebody dissect them because I wanted to see things that he's doing. Very perceptive. He studies really hard. It's not some sort of magic, you know, but he does, he does, fo- you know, he's, he does focus on reads and all the live tell stuff and he's able to exploit as well. Like he just, I think if you ask, like if you ask Ali, I'm sure of it, who I know he studies with Ali, even though Ali's been winning everything, he will say he believes, you know, Jake is the best right now. And, that, and I'm saying this, with limited sample, like I haven't played with everyone. So I should clarify of the people that I've played a substantial amount with, that'd be Jake. I'm sure there's crushers online who are maybe better than them, whatever, that I don't even know who exists, but I can't really speak. And this is why I always find it weird when people talk about people being the best at something. I'm like, how the fuck do you know, right? Like who's the best heads up player? Whoever you heard someone say, like if you don't play it and you're not in the streets, like 
you can't really have a, a, an opinion, I don't think. So from the people that I've played with, I find Jake is the toughest. I, I think that you make a lot of good points there. As for Jake specifically, what, one thing that I like what Jake does, there's sort of a class of online regs that I just don't really trust to play conservative when they need to and, and value their tournament life. I'm going to go ahead and put myself in that category where they're good, they're sharp, but then they'll just get stacked needlessly when they don't have to, or they're not trying to really maximize their chance of cashing or when they're on the mid to small stack, they play too aggressive and they're more like, they're more prone to mistakes. Whereas Jake is just real. He's real scrappy when he's on those types of stacks and he just clings to life. Well, and he, I mean, he's good in the big stack too, but I think Jake just has this sort of toughness that he plays with and this will to survive that I think gives him an edge. And he's also, he's also good. Of course. I mean, I've played, I've played with Jake a, a good amount. We used to chat every now and then. I think I would have my weirdest conversations of any person I've ever met with Jake. We'd have conversations that would be like this. I'd say, Hey, you're going to play the 25 can Tuesday. And he, he might respond. Did you know that the sky is not red? It's blue. And then I'd be like a Jake response. And he didn't say that specifically, but he would say something <laughs> like that. And I would say, "Where well, everything good. <laughs> and then he'd be like, <laughs> no waffles on Tuesday. Doug. It was just yeah. shit like that. Like he would just say like completely random stuff back. So you bring up a good point. One of the things he does not do, he does not punt. Fourth and one, you know, I mean, like, whatever. he's not a punter. Like, you just don't see him, especially because, like, if you were going to play these high rollers and you're playing for money, you have to have a deep understanding of ICM. If you don't, you're going to be making big mistakes. Like, I always learn from them because, for me, I, one of my advantages in terms of being able to, you know, win or whatever, or theoretically should, is I don't care so much about playing for the money. I just want to win the titles, right, which allows you a little bit of freedom. But I've seen some guys do some things like, I, I watched Ali do this, this thing at the final table, which at, I, I, at first I thought I understood why, but then I'm like, oh my God, there's so much more to it. Uh, there were, the blinds were uh, 15 and 30,000, I believe, 15 and 30,000. And he had 520 under the gun with pocket tens, right? Five handed. So most people are like, all right, you, either, you, know, you can min raise, you can jam, whatever. He opened for 220. On the, so he opened for like 220, leaving 300 behind, right? So you, like, why, would, why do you think he would do that? Well, I think he's trying to get a desired result from the ranges of people at the rest of the table. Maybe, maybe people are not going to play as appropriate versus that open size where they have to consider the people. Behind. I mean, there could be stack size stuff. I'm not sure what, what, what is okay, the reason. So basically what he's doing is essentially jamming, right? It's right. Like, He's putting in 220s up here. He's essentially jamming, except he leaves himself the out from an ICM consideration. If let's say I jam behind him, somebody else jams behind him. What is that third player's range, right? So at first I thought about it as like, okay, from an, he can ladder, right? But then when you, I added the second layer of understanding of like, not only can he ladder, his tens are just no good. Like his tens against a, a jam and another jam is completely destroyed because the third player is folding ace king in that spot. From an ICM perspective, they're probably supposed to fold a ace king. So what is he up against? Always dead. So he's like going to be a four to one dog if he calls. So not only from an ICM perspective, does it allow him to ladder and 10 big blinds in these things, which he, which is what he left himself with is not that bad. Like it's, it's actually a stack that you can play. So he allows himself the extra opportunity of staying alive, but also avoiding an obvious range that is like, has him destroyed maybe ace king once in a blue moon i doubt it but it's aces kings queens jacks is like marginal in that spot wow yeah that so makes i learned that from, i learned that through osmosis in a lot of cases just from watching like what some guys who actually studied these spots uh, ali was I, I think the first person in the upswing lab i think he was the first guy if, yeah. if, if he wasn't the first he was he was one of the first and we actually played some heads up matches in preparation for our match which he fucked me up and then tweeted <laughs> a picture of him drinking like cheers yeah. to Doug. I'm like, great. This is going awesome. The, the, the prep work is really going well here. <laughs> um, anyway. So, um, but I want to go back to just a couple of things on the, the duel going back to this for a moment. Um, so the ace jack suited hand when you had ace queen. So uh, look like he might just be clicking buttons, but do you worry about live tells when someone limps ace jack suited and you raise ace queen and they fold? Do you worry that he has a read on you or are you not worried about that at all? Well, you would, right? You would if you saw that consistently, 
right? But when you see, like, when you have, when he's three betting you, when you have tens and jacks and ace king and he's like three betting, like, I think a lot of it is guess, guessing for the most part. Like, I'm sure, like, you know, you have some sort of feel. I don't think there's, I had plenty of reads on him, like in the two nines hand. Uh, when he three bet me, I was quite certain that he was doing his zoom, zoom thing. Um, so I had, I had several reads. Mostly I had specific reads on like on the turn, like, or whatever, when he was super strong, right? Like very significant, clear slam dunk reads that are hundred percent taken to the bank. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's something to be concerned with to, to a certain degree, but I think it's one of those spots where like, if it happens once you're like, okay, well, whatever. But if he's con- like, I mean, if you were playing online and a guy's like on the river, always calls you when you're bluffing and always falls when you have it. You go, wait a minute, you know? So it's all about sample. And I think over the, you know, the longer period, there was no consistency in it. You know, sometimes he was folding the best hand. Sometimes he wasn't, but like when he does the one time correctly, it's like, wow, what yeah. magic. Oh my God. What a fold. You know? I, I remember a hand on poker after dark where they're doing a sit and go. And I want to say he limp folded Queens on some epic amount of blinds. It was a five lines or something, something just, yeah. something. Just- I think part of why he does that. I really do believe that. Cause it's like a small thing. It's not that big a deal. So it's, it's obviously a mistake. Right. But it's not that huge, but it's like, if he's right, oh my God, he can make the internet explode. And he can use that as sort of a tool to be like, look at my reading ability. You know what I mean? And like, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah I think that's a thing. Like when he laid down, he limp folded like King Jack and Antonio with King Queen. It's like, who does that? I'm like, well, just you, Phil. Just you. I, I was so scared in that hand I played versus him on high six poker where he had Queen 10. I had 10 seven on Jack nine eight. Yeah. I was so scared if I folded that he was going to have something else, how bad I would look. Oh my God. Can you imagine? Help me with jams. You don't stack them there with the straight, but that's a tough I, consideration that people don't think about when you're on TV. Right. Cause you know, yeah. that's going to make freaking that's going to be the out there and you're going to have to deal with all the shit. If he just had like the 10 blockers. Which is what he said. Yeah. Did you hear the table talk during that? I did a video on that hand. Oh, okay. I didn't see that. Oh, I should check that I did out. a video on like what you probably were thinking and, Cause like, okay. you know, people, people are talking about is, you know, like, what, is it the greatest lay down? I think it's a really, really obviously fantastic lay down, but when you factor in all the stuff and you kind of did, you're kind of like, nah, this is just a fault. Right. I, 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 I want it to be a, a truly great all time lay down, but I kind of just don't think that it is. I kind of think that it's just supposed to be a fold when you look at the jam and you look at the third player behind, if there was heads up just me and him, then it would be a, a bit of a different class of it. But when you consider that the button bet, the button can just have queen 10 here. There's a third guy here that stacks Phil if he's just doing some fucking nonsense. So I think it's a really good fold. I, I wouldn't say it was an, an all-time great one. But man, when, when I laid it down, I, I just, I please don't show me the, the, the blockers. <laughs> Imagine if he's, I had the blockers and it's just pocket tens. And, and oh my God, living that down afterwards would have been, would have been unbearable. Um Anyway, a couple of these hands I want to talk about. So there was there was a hand I think you were talking about here a second ago where Phil three bet you with queen three suited. You called with nines. The flop is three, three deuce. And the hand already goes off the rails because he checks the flop. And I, one of the he first the things. Flop. He, 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 he led the flop and he checked the turn. I thought he checked the flop. Pretty sure. I mean, you can double check, but pretty sure. Okay. He led the flop and then he checked dark on the turn. I, I was going through these and writing notes down and. and I'm actually a little more worried about my note taking ability if I double check through this right before this call and then still got it wrong. But, um, oh man, I'll look that. I'll look it up after. We'll we'll, we'll check yeah, it out. Yeah, because after. You, that that would have like because I didn't bet the flop. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm like I'm ninety. You can double check, but I'm pretty sure that he uh, okay led on the uh, flop and then checked dark. The why don't Why don't you start telling us your thoughts by the hand while I, while I look this up just to just to get the right action? Yeah. So this is the one hand that I'm most disappointed with in the entire match like all three of them, because sure, like in the second match, Phil started bluffing more, but there were certain spots where he just wasn't going to be. And this was one of them. Um, pre-flop, I had a read that he was like on, on track. So th- this is, so mistake number one with the two nines was just calling the three bet again, because I thought it was trashy. And I thought, but in my mind, in the spot, I'm like, you know what? Let's just let him, because he he'd started like three bet betting, betting, betting with garbage. So I was like, all right, I'll just, you know, trap as he says with the nines. The he, better he, play he did. He check raised the flop. What? He check raised the flop. On the three three deuce. Sorry, three three. The queen three nines. I can't believe. No. I'm looking at the clip. <laughs> check raised all in on the turn. He double check raised you. Unless this is just saying the wrong thing on the graphic. 
Yeah, the graphic is wrong. Well, then I, I, I blame, <laughs> I blame poker. Go. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, like the thing is against Phil with two nines there, if you're not laying minus 150, right? Jamming on it or re-raising in their prints, like big time, because of the way he constructs his three betting range, right? We already talked about, he doesn't three bet with tens, with jacks as often. And, um, you know, if you, you know, if he has ace, anyway, so the, the move was to like four bet pre and I didn't, I just flatted. And now on the flop, from, at least from my memory, he bets the flop and I of course call with the nines. And then the turn card, he checks. And I have like the worst nines actually. Because I was thinking about this too. Yeah, I have literally the nine of spades and the nine of clubs. There are two spades and two clubs, right? So as I'm thinking about it, I'm like, okay, I have the worst bluff catcher probably. But I felt like in that spot, I was like too high up in my range that I can have there. And I thought that there was enough combo draws for some hands that he had for value that he was trying to protect that were worse than mine. But, yeah. but in retrospect, I feel like it's, it was just like a bad mistake. I can, part of me was like, you know what? Fuck it. I can call here and end the match. Let's just move, move on. I want to go to the Vegas Golden Knights game, which is, which is happening. And I want to make it there. But I was really disappointed, even after using a couple of time banks, then I went ahead and made that call. Now, if it was against you, right? And I just would have insta-called. I wouldn't have even considered like, because you can have a lot of hands I beat there, you know, and it's fine. In theory, like if you run this, the nines is a slam dunk call, even with the blocker nines, like the nine of clubs, nine straight. Like you can't fold that after betting 35K on the turn, which was half pot, and he raises 90 more all in. Like you just can't fold nines there in theory. But on, you know, with PTO, Phil, you know, <laughs> Phil theory optimal, it's, uh, it's, it's a spot where check raising turn was going to be way, way stronger than not for him, I felt. Yeah. So, so, the thing is, when people are three betting correctly, they can have six through eights here pre, and then those hands are going to sometimes take check raise all the lines on the turn. I think at least seven, eight, eight, eights for sure, uh, sevens and sixes maybe it gets a little bit different. Maybe they lean towards better check call. But so the when you ever you start to be able to beat some value, you're, you're kind of forced to call in these spots because if someone's playing appropriately, they're going to have their semi bluffs. You're ahead of those, and then if you beat any value, you get into pure you get into pure call territory. It does suck when you have uh, nine of spades and nine of clubs, and then it also does suck when your opponent is Phil Hellmuth. Um, the only thing I, I can say is that I don't know exactly the big wide depth here, but there can be some stack size. I actually had a nine ten versus you in a very similar spot um, that I reviewed. I, I, I recently did a little thing at Upswing for our our match and went through some hands and stuff. Where I think you had queens and you check raised me and you barreled off and I called you down with nines and we were I think we were like two buy ins deep. Um, so I actually had a very similar spot and, and had this ex these exact emotions as I was getting check raised where I had nines. I, it was an over pair, but what am I beating? But you know, obviously you could have some bluffs. So it's tough with nines in those spots to make the right decision. I don't know. I, I guess I guess just overall I don't know what I would do in this situation, but it is a very difficult one here with nines. Yeah, but like again, I really think like if you know, given another minute, like I had one time bank left. And, you know, yeah. you, you know, like I've always got this fear and paranoia of like running out of time banks. And that's why I always have a stack of them and I never use them. But like I was afraid of using the very last one for this. So then I just just I just made a mistake, frankly, you know, because, again, like I said, if I was playing against you or if I was playing against, you know, a lot of different players, I would have. It's, it's a fine call, but it's specifically against Phil. I just think his range there is way too strong. Like he can have ace four. He can have six, four, he can have a three, a random three. Like yeah. I did feel like too, with my pre-flop read that he was like doing his big card, big little thing, which is just like, Oh, I have King four queen three. Like those, that's his three betting range. Like big, little, no straight draw, no flush draw. Fuck any of that shit. Just, you know, although in this case he was suited, but also, uh, also I don't think Phil is going to correctly assess the value of his over pairs here right i don't think he's gonna like wow kings is a huge monster and he's gonna think oh ace four is a straight six four. phil likes to think about what the nuts what the nuts is basically and i think he would just be kind of overplaying over pairs like this like i think he's more polarized when he takes this line i don't know like yeah, i, I, I don't have a ton of over pairs right because we talked about like yeah. tens and jacks sure yeah you know, he doesn't three but and besides i had a read preflop that he was not strong so that helped me. I sort of discounted over pairs. Yeah. And I was like, okay, does he have this stupid fucking three, ace four, or four, six? Like those were the only hands I was worried about. I wasn't worried about over pairs at all. Like it didn't even enter into my, I actually ex just completely excluded them. 
Okay, so there's one last hand we got to talk about. I mean, it's, it's the most talked about hand, I think, of this match, which is the, the pocket twos versus eight three suited hand. I want to recap the action for everyone so we're all on the same page. The hand goes as follows. 260 approximate blinds deep, so quite deep. Daniel opens deuces to 1,500. Help me three bets, eight three of clubs to 4,800, a kind of small three bet size. Daniel four bets to 13,000, standard four bet size. Helmuth now comes in over the top with his 8-3 suited because one re-raise pre-flop isn't enough and <laughs> makes it 35,000, all right? Um, the big one, I think, is 600. So that's that's approximately a 60 big blind five bet here pre-flop. Daniel calls with pocket twos. Jack 10-6 rainbow. Helmuth checks. Daniel bets 21K into 70. Helmuth check calls the eight high nothing on Jack 10-6 rainbow. Turn is the six of clubs giving Helmuth a backdoor flush draw, and he now leads 42K and 112K and Daniel Fold. So a lot, a lot of things to talk about with this hand, Daniel. Um, I, I just want I want to get the action here out of the way. What are your thoughts on pre-flop in this hand? What, what are your what's your thinking? I'm actually most interested in in why you decided to use deuce as a four bet here, because that's a pretty non-standard four bet. And then what are your thoughts on the five bet in the situation just in general? Yeah, so the deuces, right? Obviously, you're right. Like, you know, no, no chart's going to show you that, you know, deuces is a four bet there. But part of why I give deuces more, more credit, more value is because, A, so he's three betting a ton of trash. Like, a, a big part of his rage is composed of just bluffs, like complete nothing. And then the rest is, you know, like I said, ace king, aces, kings, or whatever. What it doesn't have any of is any pocket pairs in between them, right? So, like, with deuces, I'm going to, I should, in theory, get eight, three of clubs to fold. So I pick up a nice little chunk, right? That's what, that's what you would think. <laughs> right. And then like, he's also not, he's not going to five bet me with ace queen. He's probably not going to do it with ace king that deep based on what I know of how he plays. He's flatting with all those hands that I beat anyway. So I don't expect it. We hadn't had a five bet the entire match. So I wasn't worried about that. Part of what I decided I was going to do was I was I, going into the third match was I was going to expand my four betting range because he was three betting with all this garbage in his trash uh, a lot more. And I felt like deuces was a decent candidate that plays pretty well post flop that deep. Um, and because again, I can, di- I can discount all the pairs threes through jacks for the most part. So I felt like it was okay. And then when he five bets, I'm like, Oh fuck, <laughs> I didn't see that coming, but I was like, all right, we're still way deep enough that I feel like in position, I can go ahead and call getting the price that I was. And then on the flop, he checks. And again, like, I, I don't think he's five betting with jacks or tens. So I can discount like him, him flopping a set. And I felt like um, in past hands or, you know, and this is me doing the thing, right? Like, well, he's seen me do this. Now, like I've checked back in, a, in these spots quite a decent amount. And I think, he know, I think he's perceiving my range that calls the five bet as very strong or quite strong that usually going to hit a flop like that coordinated. So if I bet it, you know, in theory, I should get his air to fold, right? And if not, you know, we'll, we can see how it, how it develops. Now he calls. On the turn, he leads the six. Here's the weird thing of the turn. He bets 42K, right? I am very, very strongly feeling like my deuces are good. That's why I use the time bank. Like, I took extra time. Part of the problem is I laid minus 150 in this match, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking, all right, I think he has just turned a flush draw, and I think I said it like shortly after with maybe a gut shot or something along those lines. The problem is if I jam, he's actually priced into call and he can hit a three, a Jack, a three, an eight, a Jack, a 10 or a club. So like, I'm not in great shape there. Right. If I had a 10 or a Jack, there's zero universe where I was folding either. of them. I wasn't folding either one of those things, but because deuces was so vulnerable after using a time bank, I'm like, okay, well, this sucks. I'm quite certain he's bluffing, but he's probably, I wonder what he would have done though. If he bet 42K and had like 60 back, like, was he planning on just going YOLO call? I think he folds it actually. Yeah, I, I think, I think he probably folds it. Um, which, which just kind of, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say the way he played this hand. I mean, it, it's, well, yeah. I, I, w- w- which, which street do you like? I mean, well, yeah. I guess, I guess I like the turn the best. <laughs> I don't well, the thing know. about the turn, what's interesting about the turn was I was going over like, what does his range look like? And it's, it's, there's a big chunk of it. That's like flush draws and gut shots and things like that. And then the other ones like, cause we, I eliminate Jackson tens completely. He could have a six, right? He could have done this with King six or queen six. Like that's one possibility. 
And then the other possibility that you have to think about is maybe pocket aces or pocket kings, not queens, because he wouldn't check the turn. He'd be too scared of an overcard coming. So aces or kings is possible. So against that entire range, like, you know, in theory, you can just get in with the deuces. But I was concerned about, uh, you know, I was concerned about him correctly calling with like, let's say he did have, you know, queen eight of clubs or something like that and be like, yeah, shit, I have to call, uh, you know, and then I, then I'm getting it in, in, in a close spot, laying minus 150, which again, was problematic. I, it's really tough in these situations to think about what you would do because these are hands that are so far off the beaten path, right? This is not a situation that anyone has run Sims on or studied for, or no one's thinking when I, when, when I'm in a 260 blind deep five bet pot, how am I going to, how am I going to deal with turn leads? That's just not a thing that anyone's trying to construct. And I think that makes it pretty difficult. A couple of things I would say a little bit differently here though, preflop, I, I still dislike the way that deuces plays in four bet pots. Yeah. I mean, you are in position, so you have that going for you, but Unless you hit a deuce, you're going to get so many really tough spots like this one where you just don't improve and now it's unclear and you might think that he's full of it, but you can't even semi bluff because if you jam, you're jamming it where if you get called, you have two outs. Well, just... I was predominantly doing it simply because I expected to get the full because he had okay. not once, he had not once in the first two matches called the four bet. So like every single time I'd four bet him, he folded every single time. Right, so okay. I, you know, I was planning on overdoing it. And again, I didn't expect to get five bet, but that was the unfortunate uh, reality of what happened. And then when you, also when you have deuces, you block him from having the high card, low card thing too, right? He's a little more less likely to be bluffing. So I don't know. De deuces just, it, it just feels, you probably just, I mean, you obviously thought he was weak and, and you went for it. And I mean, he was weak to be fair. So yeah, Panda. And the other thing is on the flop, the flop is so weird to me because Jack 10, six rainbow, it usually, so usually when there's a three better or a four better on a caller, it's easy to think about who the flop favors, like with four betting, right? If you four bet and I call and it's Jack 10 six, the caller, if I'm the caller, I know I'm doing good in this board, right? This is a board where I would, I'd be leading like when we were doing back when we were playing the hands and stuff, yeah. you'd, you'd expect to see some leads here, right? Cause it's a board where I can have some stuff. It gets really weird when it's four bet five bet, because when he five bets, he is so polar. Um, I think, I think when you five bet, you're supposed to see bet almost all the boards a lot. Uh, I remember we played a weird five bet pot um early on and i'm running Wasn't it the one where you misclicked and fucking won with jack high or <laughs> not, not, not high. no i, I actually I, I had i had a timing tell in that hand by the way it's the only timing tell i had in the entire challenge was that hand which one the nine seven seven four where i had nine seven and, and i five bet you but i did misclick i misclicked because i was deciding should i five bit normal or should i jam and then my time ran out and i had to click it and so i i I had a timing tell, but I also misclicked. So it was like this perfect storm of weirdness to create this, the one where you had seven, four of diamonds, right? We're talking about? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, where it was yeah. like, you min, you min five bet or something like so that. So this is my read on that hand. That was the only time you ever tanked a long time and then four bet me. And I think what, what it was is you were 200 and something blinds deep. So you had to check your chart to see which, which hands to four bet. <laughs> That's that's probably right. I was like, well, fuck. Yeah. Like, 200 bigs. Yep, this one counts. <laughs> yeah. So I so I had I had people. We were mapping out all the timings, and you had almost no timing tells. But there was one thing our guys figured out. It was that day. They're like, I think pre flop there might be a timing tell, and and we, we had like color coded things. And I was like, uh, I'm not so sure about this because he has none of the because you were you were using a standardizer, right? It always or like some kind of gate. You had some kind of timing gate where. It would take until the same amount of time, right? Every time. Yeah. Yeah. So there was no tells. Yeah. So there was no tells post flop, but pre flop, I think you didn't have that. And then random, then randomly you time banked super long pre flop and four bet me. And I had nine seven offs. Oh, so you actually meant to five bet it, but you meant to five yeah. bet it. Okay, I, mean, I, I thought yeah. you just fucking actually, because like when you did that and you misclick, like part of me is like, I should just go all in here. Like I really, and I think it's actually oh. a good play. I should have just jammed because like, what the fuck is this shit? You know, it's, that been click. it's like it's so likely for you to have misclicked there it's so much more likely that you misclicked than you actually meant to do that you know well i wanted to do something but my time bank was about to hit the thing and i didn't know if i had time so i didn't want to time out so i i was just i was just struggling to do something and i clicked that and i, I, was, oh, I guess we're gonna go with this <laughs> and it was really <laughs> small and then you started time banking and i'm thinking oh this is gonna get weird now i know he has a weak hand but He's going to get the odds lot. here. He's going to get the <laughs> odds here. And then I hit a pair. Yeah. And then you hit a, I was, oh, that was a fucked up hand. No, but that wasn't what I was talking about. I think I had Jax and you had Ace King. I think there was an Ace on the river. Um, And I ran the Sim on it. And I think you, 
you check hold the flop. It's it's so long ago now. I can't remember the specifics, but the point is I ran a five bet sim and you're supposed to bet the flop a lot when you five bet because you're really polarized and you have aces and kings a lot. So his check call is just, it's just strange on this flop. You know, it's a strange, it's a strange line. I mean, yeah, but like you have to, obviously, we obviously know, like he doesn't give a shit about any of that stuff. Sure. He does. He does what uh, he feels like is right in the moment. He's not thinking he doesn't like, and I, I didn't mean to be condescending with him, but like, he doesn't understand like he doesn't think in terms of modern poker theory or like he doesn't understand when you say like all oh, that you know you have if you say to him like well you have more king nine he's like what he wouldn't un- you know what i mean he's like well that, you know or you if you said like that's a range check or a range bet like he would he doesn't understand the lingo he's never you know studied in that way so he's not thinking in terms of like board you know or, or like you know range advantage or anything like that in certain spots it's kind of amazing how good he is considering that right the fact that I, you know, I, and look, we don't need to stroke Helmut's ego any more than than he already does. But the fact that he doesn't understand a lot of these things yet, he's competitive. I mean, you know, he's not going to be the favorite in tough lineups, but he's still competitive. He's still capable of stuff. He's still able to make moves and kind of pick and pick some spots and go yeah, for it. I so. think part of it is, you know, I think this is why poker, I think, will never really die is that while online, right, like people can, you know, randomize, they can they can get pretty damn close to playing GTO Game Theory Optimal. It's not going to happen live for quite yeah. a long time. It's just, there's always going to be people, people that are imbalanced, right? So the fact that he's completely imbalanced is okay, right? Because let's say in theory, like, let's say if you called at one at exactly the right frequency, okay? So if he under bluffs, he's not costing him anything. It's not costing him anything because you're not, you're not punishing for it if you're playing, you know, in that, in that way. So the fact that people are, are, are going to always be imbalanced and there's always going to be exploits it's always going to allow like old school players who think on a deeper level or like, you know, understand exploits there. It's always going to allow them to compete. Now, as you, as you said, at the highest levels of tournaments, that becomes less and less true, but there's still room for it. Always. Well, it does cost him winning the pot less often, right? Because if he's under bluffing, he just wins the pot less. So, you know, he still gets the same amount of value with his good hands, but then his bad hands lose more. You well, know? I guess a better way to say it would be this. If like, if you are, if you're way over bluffing, Oh, no, no, no. You know what I mean. You get, you get, you get the point. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't cost him a ton as long as his opponent is playing reasonably balanced. Like, I guess the better way is like if, if you played rock, paper, scissors and you were 100% completely balanced, right? And I just threw rock every time. Yeah, I'm it's equal. I'm break even. Yeah. I'm lose to it because like you're not taking advantage. Like, but if you started to notice, wait a minute, this guy's throwing rock every time. So now you up your paper. Right, you up your paper from like thirty three percent to forty five percent. Now you start printing. And we got to find those RPS games because that sounds like some streets that we need to be in. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So let's move on. Let's talk about let's talk about some uh, another subject here. Um, let's talk about the recent Poker Go Cup. Um, congratulations on taking that down. You won one of the events. Of course, we have this massive trophy. Uh, <laughs> what were what were your thoughts on on the series as a whole, and uh, how do you think you played? Here, the frustrating thing is like, obviously, you know, you know, in big part because of the match we played and all the preparation I was doing for heads up. I haven't done, I never did a lot of work on like tournaments or, or 40 big lines or less or anything, but like all the work I did, and we discussed this privately on the heads up made me like do really, really well deep stack in these tournaments. Like I was, I felt very, very confident, you know, I was building stacks in every one of these poker goes early and then, you know, cards on their back. I was just doing really bad in all ends and whatever, but like, deep down, like I knew I was playing really, really well. Just again, the results weren't there. Like I bubbled the very first event and, you know, had some near misses here and there. Um, but again, I thought I was, was playing pretty well. Um, and so going into the 50 K, uh, I mean, obviously they're always they're you know, the, the higher the buy-in, the like the tougher the table typically. So it was a tough table, but I, like, again, I, I thought I played pretty well. Like, obviously I ran a couple bluffs. Some of them, I don't know, the deuces again, I ran a bluff with deuces. I think this one's fine. You tell me if you're in this one. This is the final table. I actually was second in chips. I opened with deuces. Uh, uh, David Coleman called. And it came like queen jack nine. And it's an ICM spot for him, right? So he checked. I bet the flop. He called. The turn was an eight. So now it's eight, nine, jack, queen. But it was also a club. He checked. I bet half pot. He called. The river was a blank. He checked. I bluffed half pot, right? And I'm like, I'm something like, I have to have some bluffs, bluffs there. And I remember like every time I looked at a damn solver, it's like deuces and threes. I'm I like, know. yeah, go bonkers. You yeah. unblock everything, right? And I, I don't know. I think a lot of people are like, well, why would you bluff there? It's like, because he really, especially with the ICM spot, like 
If he has a 10, he's going to call me fine. But if he doesn't, I think people, humans probably in that spot overfold against me for sure with like two pairs, pair and a flush draw, those types of hands. So felt fine, you know? Yeah, uh, I, I think I think it's pretty, I mean, not having a king seems good and then not having a pair is obviously good. And then you have no, in a, lot, in a lot of those, in a lot of those spots where it's really polarized, I think the solver likes the deuces and the threes because they're, they have no connectivity to it. So you, 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 don't block any potential folds. So I think, I think that that seems, seems okay. I mean, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be the most shocked if some ACE X hands end up being preferred there, but I've not done a lot of ring ICM Sims. So uh, I, I can't say it, but it seems at least okay. I would bet, like, I would think deuces is like really, really high up there. And I never ran it, but I would say deuces is probably really high up there. And like, I think one of the better bluffs, because like you said, for all the reasons I unblock everything. Um, I think it's probably better than ACE X too, but anyway, who knows? So anyway, no, I felt really good about it. It was just a relief, you know, especially like everyone's coming at me like, oh, don't, he's at you again. I'm like, what the fuck did he do now? What did I, I thought we were cool. What? A, and then I was like, all right, but I watched it. I'm like, no, nah, he just, all he did was point out the insanity of like an eight, nine year run, which could mean a couple of things. A, I'm just like the worst human being ever at any form of heads up poker, whether it's Omaha eight stud, deuce to seven, you know, all these kind of things. Um, but I think what it illustrates that a lot of people don't realize is how much fucking variance can play a role in who we hold up as, you know, hero or, or like the sucker, right? Like, did I probably blow a couple of those? Absolutely. Was I a favor? Was I supposed to win some of those at the very least? Like you put a random donkey in there. He's going to win more than one out of like 10, you know? Um, I mean, the one that I definitely think I blew was against Keith, Keith Tilson, uh, in the hundred K. Uh, at the world series in 2019 i really feel like i blew that and maybe that was a question of like a little bit of pressure and anxiety over the fact like holy fuck i don't want to come second again this is too much um but overall i think it just shows like and the fact that here's the thing that's missing from the equation is like all those second place finishes after all those years without a win how in the fuck am i ahead you know <laughs> like i steal them up and i haven't done the exact tally but it's between nine or ten million in that period in terms of overall profit before taxes and stuff like that. Cause people like point that out and shit on me. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, it's just one of those weird things that can happen. You know, I, in my, in the start of my career, I won the first eight times that I was six handed or less. I was like eight. No. So I don't know. I don't know if it's the law of averages or whatever, but like, I mean, it's just, I'm glad it's over put it to that match that I actually got, you know, a real win under the belt. Once you have that in your head, it's really hard to play your a game as well. I, I know coming from a career and heads up, I would go through stretches where sometimes you'd lose 30 buy-ins or, or you, you know, 40 buy-ins or whatever, even in matches you're winning. And then I remember going through some of those and starting to feel like maybe I'm just really bad at this. Every, every aggressive play you're doubting yourself, every close call, he probably just has it. You, and you just get in this mindset that's really not healthy for playing your best poker because you know, I, I really do think when people are winning, they tend to just play better because they're not afraid of the result that happens. And when people are losing, human beings have emotion, right? We, we all would love to be perfect robots when it comes to poker and play the absolute perfect game and never tilt or whatever. But it's hard to really separate yourself from any emotion on prolonged losing streaks. And once you're kind of aware of a streak, then it, it does play a, a, you know, a small role. I mean, you, you can of course do your best to just stay in the moment, but it's at the back of your mind. And, and especially on something like getting second place in tournaments, it's so funny the way that we view it. When someone gets second place in a tournament, you know, good for them. They had a good score, but you don't, you kind of forget about it. When someone wins, they're the champion. They won. Mm -hmm. And when you have a series of wins, people think, Oh, that's really, that's really notable that that, that person's won. I mean, I don't, I don't, I have to have to think about this. I don't think I've ever gotten second in, in a big tournament. I've only played, gotten deep in a few, um, but I've been lucky to win those matches. And it's just funny when I hear like, oh, Doug, you already went three places. You did really good for yourself so far. It's like, yeah, but if I'd gotten three seconds, people would be like, man, never won a bracelet. You know, it's like three heads up matches. Like can be the difference between, can be, can be the difference between someone viewing you in a really positive way or someone viewing you in a negative way, which is, it's funny how much we stress that victory versus second place. Yeah. I think what it's taught me even after all these years is just like how much variance plays a role. It played a role in my like really good streak and it's also played a role here. And I try to explain like, so these high rollers that I play, right? Imagine like, say there's 40 players and let, let's imagine just for the sake of this, they're all equally skilled, right? Like if you put 40 balls in a, in a bingo ball, right? And you pulled one out and you, you did that like 30 times. Oh my God, this ball number four is amazing, 
right? Ball number three keeps hitting. There's always going to be streaks like that with the Fedor Holtz, the Dan Coleman, the Eric Seidel. You're always going to see that, especially when you look at, you know, smaller fields. And one of the things that blew my mind when we were playing heads up, is my guy just to try to explain to me how much variance plays a role here. He's like, he ran a sim, 10 million hand sim, two players that were, you know, heads up that were zero B, but they're dead even, right? Just to see how much like one player, one player went on a 600 buy-in downswing. 600 fucking buy-ins. Like that seems impossible. And that's two evenly skilled players, right? So like when I saw that, I'm like, holy shit, man. Like we chose, especially, you know, we chose to play a game where, you know, so often variants can make you look like, you know, like a hero, like the hero or the idiot, you know, the, the hard part, as you said, is being human being is like fighting through those rough times and actually knowing deep down. And I've been playing poker for over, well, like well, 30 years now. So I feel like I've gotten pretty good at knowing when it's me, when I'm like, no, no, I'm just getting trounced. Like they're totally outplaying me. Or it's like, I'm getting cock fucked. You know what I mean? Like, right. Be, yeah. Yes, that's and never good. No one, no one wants to get cock fucked. Um, <laughs> why, why do you tweet so many bad beats? Like, I just me, was for, <laughs> I, I have to ask you this because for me, like, I, I, I don't know, like, I, I just, I just can't do it. I just, I'm, I'm not gonna. Everyone goes through bad beats. Why, why are you so expressive and vocal? I, I think some people get kind of like, tilted when they read that. So, so part of it was like I was just tweeting my results, right? Like what, how I busted, and it was just like it happened to be like that every time but i get it everyone's like okay enough because it's like do you ever have good luck and i'm like dude i'm not fucking kidding like the last seven all ins, like i'm not joking like part of it i guess is like when people do that like why would they do that right part of it is like deep down there's part of their ego that's saying listen i'm actually good i don't suck look look at how i lost like when alan kester does it look at this look at this i think that's part of it it's obviously a bad practice but like as i'm fucking doing it i'm just raging and sometimes i believe like that and this is something Phil Helmy, I think, has gets right to a certain degree. We're all emotional, right? He vents in the moment. He lets it all out. This fucking idiot from Northern Europe and blah, 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 blah. I think if you deal with it in the moment, like I did with our matches when I would have my epic rants that are like NFT worthy at this point. Um, <laughs> like, I just want to get it out, right? So I get out all the steam. I get it all venting. And then when I'm done with it, I'm like, all right, let's get back in the lab. Let's go over the hands. Let's take a look at the things that I can control. Like, where did I make mistakes? Oh, this was a bluff catcher I should have called you with. This was one that was probably, you know, over, and then, you know, go over the stuff like that and then be ready the next day. Like I allow myself to deal with it in the moment. So maybe tweeting the bad beats is like part of that venting process that uh, I understand that the average person is like, oh, enough to unfollow. Imagine if everyone did that though. Just imagine what the, what, what Twitter would look like. <laughs> imagine if you hopped on and well, there's 17 like, bad beat stories look for ago, you. Do you remember years ago, and I created an account just for this called at DN Chips, where like people would be like, end of first break, sitting on 21,375 from 20. Like, wow, thank you so much. And then you'd see like a whole heap of them, you know? Uh, I, yeah, I, yeah. I remember people had accounts like that. 21,375 after level one. Well, it's, it's a little different when you have a following though. If, if you have people yeah. that really do want to see how you're doing and I-, I Right, but there would be people that yeah. like, didn't have a following and kind of nobody can. And they were all yeah, like, oh, ouch. Like, everyone you follow is like, oh fuck. Shots fired. Uh yeah. okay. So so we talked about that. Um I want to talk a little bit about WSOP. Um, so what are your thoughts on actually I have two different things I want to talk about here. First, what were your thoughts on Helm Youth hit, trying to sort of basically say the online caches shouldn't count as caches? Why does he care so much? Why, why, why does it mean so much to him that these things shouldn't count? Did you see what well, he tweeted about yeah, this? I'm, so I want I'm so I want to just get clear. Like, so he wants the actual bracelets to count, but not the caches to count. I think so. Right. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> cause, Cause he's ahead in bracelets by a good margin, but not in caches. Cause like I, you know, I passed him with the online. Good point. Good point. I wonder if there's anything that <laughs> he can self-serving with that. Right. I don't, like, I don't, I don't think so. Knowing Phil, I, I don't think so. Here's the thing, right? It either counts or it doesn't count. Like you can't just say like the bracelet counts, but the cash doesn't count, right? If you're compiling a list, if you want to keep them separate, live bracelets versus World Series online bracelets and the online bracelets don't count for the same thing, I guess that's fine. Then you do the same thing with the caches, but it only makes sense to be consistent where if the bracelets count, what, the second place doesn't count? Like how does, you know, so only if you come first, it counts, but if it comes seconds, it doesn't count. I don't know. I don't really care about the cash. The caches is like, look at how many times I lost. You know, look, look how many times I didn't win. I don't know. It's 
it's the whatever. I I kind of I I kind of feel like they are a little bit different. I mean, I get that we had to have online ones, especially in the COVID era. Um, and we were even having some before they, they do feel a little bit different to me, but if you're going to call them WSOP events, I mean, I guess, I guess it seems fair to count them, but yeah, I, I think we just have some kind of standardized thing. Um, I guess the worry is if we reach some point where there's just a million events all the time and they all count, um, we could end up with some really inflated numbers on things. Yeah, maybe maybe that, that doesn't even matter. I think we're just into like, partly it's because we were in this weird time with COVID. So this online thing happened and we're like, all right, we're gonna do the online series again. And then the world series is going to do it because, you know, this time slot is no longer, you know, the, the live event happening. And we're also going to have the live event. So it's just kind of a weird year. I hope that next year things, you know, come back to some sort of sense of normalcy where, you know, we don't have like a year long world series of poker. And, you know, here's the thing, like people always say, like, don't you worry about like devaluing the bracelet. I'm like, okay, you realize the first one was like one by vote, right? Where they just said like, nah, you win. You're the best. There was a bracelet where like two guys showed up, one guy won, he won a bracelet. Like for me, when I started in the late nineties, there was no buy-ins less than 2000. That was the mint, like, and there was one event a day, you know? And then I remember like there was 1500 started to come about. And I'm like, are you serious? You're gonna have a bracelet for $1,000? Like that for me was the threshold. I'm like a thousand, but it's all personal. It's all personal preference when people say what should and shouldn't count. They broke in that, they've broken that barrier. There's $400 buy-ins, there's 300s. We're gonna have a flip and go. We're going to have a GG flip and go bracelet this year. Right. So like the question of like, what should count? What shouldn't count? Like, Oh, I, I saw Remco tweet. Like these don't count. I'm like, actually they do because they say they do. Right. It's like, right. if it's a world series of poker branded event where you get a bracelet, you know, the bracelet counts. It's going to be, it's too difficult of a task to start to say, Oh, these types of bracelets count. These don't like if you're, if you're a stud player, you're like only the stud bracelets count. These stupid, no limits don't count. If you're a no limit player, you're like, oh, these eight games are stupid. You know, like whatever. If they branded World Series bracelet events, no, you'll see me and Phil playing them. <laughs> this is one of the this is one of my most hated takes. I've had some really hated takes along the way. Uh, I don't like soccer. Uh, I don't like uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, those those are of course both way up there on my. That's most hated where you're takes. just fucking wrong. Okay, no. perfect. That's you're, you're just you're, wrong about. You fit it right that's, with everyone else. That's you. That's not the show. That's just a you thing. Fair, but I think my all time most hated take was when I thought when I said that I thought that these. WSOP buy-ins that are getting down to $500, $400. They shouldn't have events like this. And the amount of people that said, you rich prick, you think you're, you're too good for a $500 bracelet event. Right. I think I even tweeted if they one day we'll have the hundred dollar one. Well, why shouldn't we have a $100 one? It, it, people were outraged. They were angry. And, and look, like I get trying to be inclusive. I'm not trying to take away people's dreams, but I do feel like there's a little bit of things should mean something. And in a time when the dollar is the least strong it's ever been with inflation um, or le relative to US dollars, I feel like we shouldn't be lowering the bar and lowering the bar and make this like, how much money can we just get out of these guys and shake them down? I do think the bracelet should kind of mean something and have some kind of threshold that some kind of threshold, you know, and may maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it is $400 or whatever it is. Um, but I don't think so. I think I think bracelets should be a little bit higher stakes and a little bit more prestigious. And they and I think they should kind of mean something when you win one. Well, I mean, definitely for me, right? I started playing, I started traveling to the World Series in 1996. Okay. And I traveled there with like two, three thousand dollar bankroll, right? And I'd play satellites. They would play like the one table satellites with the dream and hope or the super satellites of getting into an event, right? So that was my World Series of Poker experience in 96. I never played in the official ba -ba -bom, big championship event in 96. I wasn't able to in 1997 either. I just missed in a, in a satellite, but I still experienced the World Series of Poker. Then when I finally did in 1998, get a chance to play in a World Series of Poker event, which I actually won, um, <laughs> uh, it was super special, right? Because it was like elite, it was prestigious. It required like a serious investment. And I agree with you in the sense that like, when you get to the point where it's for the average Joe, it's just changed. Part of the reason it had to change was simply financially, right? The World Series was special in, in, in the way that it was in, in the old days. It was a collection of gamblers, bring them all to Vegas, play the series event. It got corporate. It got big. It got mainstream. It got on ESPN. It got into this huge convention center, right, where you need to fill these seats. So how do you fill these seats? You're not going to fill these seats by running, like, nothing but 10Ks, right? So part of it was, like, they were trying to attract the average Joe and give them something. So, like, as much as I agree with you, 
you know, and I would have loved to have seen like just this, you know, high roller circuit. We were the elitist rich pricks as, as you know, people can call us. Like I get from their perspective, the, it makes financial sense for them to reach out to the average show and give them that. But I would, I do, that's why, I, that's why I really enjoy what Kerry Katz is doing with the poker go with these, like, you know, what he's calling majors. It's a small field, right? And it was like, Oh, those don't count. There's only 35 people. I'm like, if you're 35 really good players playing for a lot of money and it's sort of like recaptures in a way, a lot of that old school vibe of like, you know, winning the cup. That was special to me. It was a big deal. Yeah. That, that makes sense that there's sort of something that's kind of taking the role that it once used to, that bracelets once used to hold. I mean, back in the day, a lot of these events had nine people or 18 people, or they were very small events. I didn't even know the first one was voting. That's, that's not even an event. Yeah. They Um, literally played for three days. Everyone played and you're like, yeah, he fucking wins. He's the best. Johnny Moss, you're the champ. Can you imagine getting people to agree nowadays? (laughs) That would be great. Like Phil Helmuth would win every year. Uh, Oh God. (laughs) Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that something kind of takes its place though, and has a little bit more of the, the prestige and with what they're doing there. I mean, I, I played in the, in the, in the, was it the, the masters, the poker masters a few years ago. Um, and I, I kind of, I kind of felt the, the vibe that they were going for there. So I, I do think that's a pretty cool, pretty cool structure. Um, I think, I think though, like it's good for the WSP obviously to bring in people and I get that it's corporate and they have to do that to some extent, but you know, how far are, are we willing to go? And at points, do we then have moments that cause confusion, kind of like with the WSIP main event thing that happened last year? Um, I, I actually kind of talked to all the parties involved, and I kind of feel bad for everyone on that one, actually, because I think that it just wasn't super clear, kind of across the board to different people. And then my understanding at GG was there was like a notice that got sent to the guy that wasn't, it shouldn't have been worded the way that it was worded and it added to the confusion. And but, but my point that I'm making here is the more events that we have, the more stuff like that can kind of happen, the more we open the door for there to be confusion. Obviously, this is COVID specific, so it is a little bit different. Yeah, that one was really frustrating for me because I was very clear. Because was, That was very important to me. Be like, are we calling, is this the actual replacement for the main event? And I was like, you know, in the calls. And it was, yeah. when I was, before it all happened, I was very clear on saying, this isn't the main event. It is an online version. It is the main event of the GG series. Hopefully, the actual main event will happen this year. So like for me, there was never any confusion, but I can understand. And I feel bad for him. Cause like, he felt like, you know, he's going to be crowned that and like, listen, the guy won millions of dollars. So it's hard to like feel too bad for the guy, but like, yeah. I totally understand. And like, listen, it was a weird year. Like the world WSOP.com had a main event. Is he like, you know, I don't know. So there was like three main event champions in the year. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I do know this, that the people at the world series poker, whatever they do consider this stuff. They do think about like, how far is too far? And, you know, is, is this okay? And stuff like that. So th- that's part of the conversation. And I think just like, hopefully this is the last year of confusion with all these, because there's also the World Series Book of Europe too. that's right. happening right after. So you're like you're talking about a shitload of bracelet events this year. Hopefully next year we can get it back to where it's like near the, like under a hundred. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you. And and I, I actually, Stoyan is going to be doing a module for Upswing. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I promise I'm not trying to work in as many plugs as possible here, but he's going to be going through that run and, and putting Your it show. in the lab. Um, <laughs> I got, got to say it when I can say it. Um, but yeah, so so with that event specifically, like it was, it was tough because like I looked at some of the wording that you said and you were clear, but then the companies weren't clear, but then they didn't fully understand themselves. And then when it, when it gets down a few levels, people get more aggressive on wording. And then I think a lot of players did treat it like it was the main. So it was tricky. It was a tricky situation. Yeah, I think people did because they weren't sure if there would be a main, right? Yeah. So it's like, it's almost like a lot of people are thinking, all right, so this is the main, unless there's a live one, right? I can, I can see where people would, you know, have that feeling and I, I get it. But like for me, and again, this could change in the future too, but I hope not. For me, the main event of the World Series of Poker must be a freeze out must absolutely must Agreed. like yeah. once that if that changes i will vehemently speak out against it um i didn't even want ours to like not be a freeze out so we sort of had a compromise where we just did like three entry max right where you could like enter a flight bust and you know you pick one of about 20 flights or something like that but people at the beginning they thought that the main event was like because we ran like 20 different flights of day ones or something like that but it was like everyone's like oh you're gonna have negrano in there firing 20 times and like no, it's, you know, three either way, but uh, we're just giving everybody an opportunity to play it, which makes sense to me. There's an epicness to the main that needs to be preserved. There's an freeze epicness out. and uh, yeah, as, as a freeze out and, and sort, sort of, 
it's it's hard to describe unless you've played the main. I'm sure a lot of people listening or watching have played the main event, so you kind of know what it's like. But there is a certain a certain it's the only event that I've played where you can sort of feel the history and the weight of it when you play it. You know what I'm saying? Everything else, you know, like I played the million dollar one drop that was cool and and it was definitely a bit different, but it didn't have this sort of this real epic weight to it that you feel when you play the main event. Yeah, no question about it. And, and you know, the other key thing about, you know, the fact that it's a freeze out is it does change the game, right? Like you're somebody I know who bluffs or probably over bluffs in certain spots, right? If you do that in, in, in events where people can just rebuy early, you're just punting because they're like, all right, whatever, it's close, right? But like when it's for their, they're like, this is it, you know, this is day one of the main event and you've just put them all in for your crazy fucking bonkers, like 10X pot fucking thing that you do on like 666 deuce ace. And you know, the guy has an ace and you don't care because he's folding, right? <laughs> like, it's like, you can't really do that if the guy can just go to the cage and rebuy because it allows, it alleviates the pressure, right? right. On people. Yeah. And I think what's so cool about the main event is it is deep stack. It is two hour levels and it does create some really dynamic situations that allow for like creative players like yourself to just really just push the envelope that you like Justin Bonimo, for example, they sort of joke in these high rollers. It's like, he gets it in, bro. It's like, he thinks he's got 0.00001% advantage. It's like, Oh, we're getting it in. We're getting it in three during the rebuy period. And then that of course changes when you're on your last bullet. Right. You actually could make some arguments that you could get a negative EV. In fact, I think that's something I remember when I first got into poker and I saw you playing some of these WSP events way back in the day where they had the rebuy events, right? The World Series. You used to do a bunch of that, right? Where you would just blast off bullets and and try and build up a stack because then obviously you have a much, much greater chance to win the event. And if you're playing to try and win these events, you can just take some negative EV spots to give you a chance to win, right? Oh, Wasn't beyond that- negative, like super negative. <laughs> like I would just get it all in blind, reflop, right? Now, here's the thing. People don't know. When, I, when there was a player's advisory committee, I was on it with a bunch of other people. I was the one, despite the fact that I was the, the rebuy king, who was vehemently trying to push to eliminate rebuys. I didn't think they were good for the World Series of Poker from a prestige perspective because it did give me a fair, unfair advantage because my goal was to win. I didn't care about the money. Financially, it was stupid, me putting like 50K into a 1K, right? And coming third for 109. Like, that's just not financially smart. But no question about it, I'm going to get a stack right? When the rebuy period is over, I'm going to have two, three times the average most of the time. Because if I, you keep getting it all in pre-flop, like I was literally doing that double rebuy. I would go all in blind with like Jack four off, get in against tens. Sometimes Jack four is going to win, yeah. you know, blind hand wins. So, and then when that happens, I would play, you know, try to play well. And I've been using that strategy, even when I was a teenager in these private games, playing $20 rebuys, because I wanted to get big stacks. So I don't think that's good. I don't think that's fair. That's something that actually, um, you know, well, I don't even want to say his name because whatever, but um, because I, I don't need any extra beefs. Uh, but like something we agree on is like, I don't like this. Having said that, if everybody is going to use reentry, so will I. Like, I got shit for saying, I think it was in late 2018, that I was considering a year of like not re entering at all. Just oh, I think like, I remember that. I think yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I literally said I was considering it because I was considering it. I'm thinking, like, you know, maybe I want to do this because I hate this shit, right? It's like, maybe it'll be a thing. But then I was playing in like the World Series Poker Player of the Year race or something. I'm like, why the fuck would I put myself at a competitive disadvantage when everybody else is rebuying? If I believe that me not re-entering would eliminate these things from the existence. Well, yeah, maybe there's something there. But like, it's just like, why would I sit down in a tournament where there's rebuys available, bust the first hand and be like, see you guys tomorrow. You know what I mean? Yeah, but why, why tweet that to begin with? Because I remember seeing you say because that. I'm dead serious. I, I know, but when yeah. you said it, and then you start rebuying because I mean, but I have- didn't actually, I actually okay. didn't for six months. I didn't even re-enter. Like when right, I but- said that, like I didn't even do it. And then the world series came around and I'm like, I want to win player of the year. Like, yeah. But you knew that was going to come, right? You, you knew well, that. I, but I was still considering it. I genuinely, like, I wouldn't have said it if it wasn't true. Right. Considering, you know, but you're right. I probably shouldn't even tweet that. Cause if, cause people will take considering it's like, he said he's not going to re-enter. And then he did, you know what I mean? I'm like, I did say the word, you know, I was considering it. But you're right. Unless I'm actually committed to doing it, there's no point in putting it out there. But part of why I put it out there is because, like, I don't know. I was having a I was having a dirty feeling about them, right? I was having a dirty feeling about, like, yeah, it isn't right that, like, some guy sits down with one bullet and has less chance to win than I do who's going to play, like, five or six bullets. And I thought, like, you know, it would be nice if everyone did that. And then I chose to, you know, take advantage of the rules that everyone else is and not do that. But you're right. It's easier. It would have been easier if I just never said anything about it and just spoke against, 
you know, the, uh, or, or just said that like, I prefer freeze ups, period. I, I think that moving away from rebuys is better for the game overall because it does put people on, on an even playing field. And it's also going to make the events softer because a higher percentage of the buy-ins are going to be non-reg. So I do like those points. It's just, if I was someone that plays tournaments seriously and I knew there were going to be events and plays, if you know, I was in your shoes and I was trying to play for player of the year, I would know that these are going to come up and then it's, what am I going to do? Am I going to be the the savior guy who's, who says, no, I'm, I'm right, but I'm going to lose well, because of it. Or? Now where, I'm in a place now where I believe like, let's just have a mix, right? Let's have some re-entries. Let's have some like freeze outs. And that's part of Fair. why like with GG, when we were trying to think of like, what is going to be our Sunday tournament? Right. Like, what are we going to p- compete with the other guys like with that have different tournaments? I'm like, why don't we go with like a massive guarantee freeze out? So we started like the hundred and fifty dollar buy in, you know, with, with a big guarantee that's got up like half a million dollars with like a player of the year, you know, player of the year type thing. So like there is something for people like that. Like so this is the way that I see this is like if you hate reentry, don't play those events or just play them one bullet or whatever. And hopefully there's enough freeze outs. You know, if you don't like freeze outs, just play reentries like. I think there's nothing wrong with variety at this point, but when I look at an event as being prestigious, like I think of the super high roller ball, 300 K buy-in, I'm like, you know, it's part of the reason it's prestigious to me is because it's not re-entry. Right. That, that plays a role. The main event of the world series of poker, part of why that is the pinnacle is because it's a one bullet deep structured tournament. There, there's a, there's a scarcity, to, scarcity to it as well. Playing a whole tournament, knowing if you are eliminated, you're done. That is, when you take that away, it very much changes the atmosphere and dynamic of a tournament. It just does. Yeah. Um, like my theory was always this, because part of the reason reentry was, was, was born was because like people would say, you know, well, what if a guy flies all the way from Florida to Vegas to play in the 10K and he busts and then he's got nothing to do? I'm like, well, what you do then is create a post limb series. So start events, like have a 2K, have a 5K and all this kind of stuff so that the guy's like, you know, he's out of the main, but it's not like he's got nothing else to play. And there are so many events in Vegas. I think that he's going to find plenty of things to play. Well, one think- of the things too, that this was used to be, the theory behind tournaments used to be this people used to run tournaments so that people would come to their casino, play the tournament. And then when they bust go play cash games. But now there's a new unique type of player that just plays tournaments. They don't want to play cash games. Right. So now the other, you know, the answer to that is just offer post limbs. Yeah. Another, another good solution. So we had, we, we asked Twitter for some questions for you and we had some good ones. And this was one of the ones that people really wanted to hear. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you take this one. Ask him why Jamie Ward says, ask him why in his masterclass promo, he says, you can't be all loosey goosey eating a sandwich at the table, but in his own kid poker documentary, there was a five minute sequence about his mother making him sandwiches to take with him to the tables. What happened there? So it's important to point out, when was that video taken? Many, many years ago, part of my learning process in creating a masterclass was looking back and saying, you know what? I was eating a sandwich all loosey-goosey on high stakes poker, and guess what? The results were not good. So as part of the evolution of modern poker theory, I deduced that it was important for the future generation to understand, do not be all loosey-goosey eating a sandwich at the table. So there you go. You saw a bad habit that was corrected, and now you won't see me loosey goosey on the table eating a sandwich anymore it's good to learn and adjust and and grow and i think that that answer makes makes perfect sense did you follow the landon tice bill perkins match at all i mean uh, yes yes i mean not like i didn't watch it or anything like that but uh i mean i followed the the brouhaha of what happened but do you have any thoughts on it yeah i mean it's tough because like for me, I mean, I guess, you know, Landon had a very small piece of it, right? Obviously, he was playing for a small, you know, for him, significant amount of money, but like probably his time would be better spent playing in softer spots or whatever. For me, it's a tough spot for him because like other people have a say in whether he continues to play because I imagine he would want to continue to play. And I don't know if like, I don't know if they made a good financial calculation because in heads up, even if they didn't feel like he was beating the spot, he still could win. He still could beat the spot, Right. Like even if he, let's say he was only beating him for four or five, that doesn't mean he can't win at 12 or 15, right? Over a period of time. So the question is, is just donating the side bet um, like going to cost you less than playing it out with the opportunity to win back the side bet? So I don't know. I I don't know. Like I'm sure that they ran the numbers and felt like it wasn't good. Maybe they felt like it was way too close to even, or maybe they felt like maybe even Bill was winning. I don't know. Like, uh, you know, whatever, but I felt it was unfortunate. As you know, I'm a trooper. Like I, you know, at the halfway point, I could have just ducked out and ran for the hills, but I was like, no, 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 
we're gonna you know we're gonna see this through, through to the end unfortunately uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah it's a weird spot when you're not like you're the fighter in the in the ring but like you don't get to decide if you continue the fight that's yeah that's a tough spot to be in I think. it was weird looking when it, when i heard about it because and i think this is just because in our challenge there was a zero percent chance of someone randomly quitting there was just we didn't even we didn't even talk about what a repercussion would be there wasn't even we didn't even oh, discuss like that after 3, yeah. years ago, what, what, what if someone what if just, I did this I, yeah. this would have been the move after the live portion when i won three buy-ins being like you know what in the post game you know what i feel like i've proved what i needed to prove here <laughs> and i think that like what just happened says it all so like we're gonna skip the rest of it and have and watch your face just melt uh, with fucking anger and rage. Oh, <laughs> uh, that would have been painful. I should have done that. Damn. That would have been some painful stuff. <laughs> Although I, I still would have won because of side bets. So I wouldn't have been too angry, but it 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 wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been the way that I would have wanted to prepare for it if it was gonna go down like that. But um what I was the point I was gonna make is it didn't even it didn't even enter my mind that quitting was even a possibility. Like it it wasn't even a part of my thought process, what's going to happen here? Oh, someone might quit. I just, I, I had spent, I don't know how many hours or days thinking about this match and, and I watched a bit of it and, and talking with both Lane and Bill. And it didn't even, I didn't even, it didn't even enter my mind that somebody could quit, that, that it would, that could happen. So when I saw it what end the way that it was like 4,800 hands, it was, a, yeah, it was a fourth that of the way like, in. That doesn't feel like much to me. I think that the, the bottom line was that team Landon, I think kind of like what you said before, the fighter didn't get to say, and I think the real mistake Landon made was not saying, hey, if you guys have a piece, I get to choose when you pull the plug. So only only enter here if you're willing to stick it out with me. Or, or you know, have a conversation and say, well, let's play at least this many hands, like 10K hands or whatever, and then we'll decide as a group whether or not it makes sense to continue. Yeah. yeah. It's one of those things where, like, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's important. That's why it was good that we had Phil Gelf on to just in case, because there's always shit that comes up, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, you said like, that. You said – you said, I don't see why we're going to need him. I think that was what you said. Yeah, and it's like, because unfortunately there was that day where it was taking me a whole lot of time to make a decision on the yeah. play. I was like, wow, what am I doing here? TikTok and watch you fume in the post game. That was oh. like, that was worth something for me. That was actually kind of fun watching you fucking lose your mind. <laughs> I, I, I realized about 10 minutes into it that something was going to, something was going to have to give here because I, there's no way I was going to be willing to limp through that. And and even though I felt like it was a little bit a little bit suspect to go that direction, I just I just I couldn't I couldn't deal with it, and it wasn't worth arguing about it. You know, it just wasn't worth it. Like we can just keep carrying on the way. And I could tell in our call because we sat out and we called Phil, and I could tell Phil was just trying to be a total diplomat and really think. You know, he he didn't want to say anything. He wanted to make sure he did, did the fair the right thing. But it, it, you definitely need to have someone that's in that role where if if there's some kind of you know because then after we talked to him, we, we basically. Figured I it think out they had some times. issue too, like Berkey was talking about, like with the playing on the site, with someone having a piece or them putting up a line. I think that was early on, which, you know, like the site had incentive or they were booking it or something like along those lines. That's weird too. Yeah, I, I heard something about that. Yeah. There was a lot of different storylines going on with that one. Um, yeah, and you know, Bill, Berkey likes the drama. So he'll find the drama. You don't say. Like, I remember we were having a conversation with privately, you know, about like, what was it? Uh, Something. Oh, like, I remember this. I remember this. I, 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 I told you tracking, you know, like you manually tracking frequencies. I told you and you told Bill. Well, we had the conversation as a group. Yeah. And then Bill tweeted about it. And <laughs> I was like, what the fuck, man? I just told you this in private. And then I just see Bill Perkins tweeting about it two hours later. Hey, you know, he's the Twitter bomb guy. which like, you know, he's, he's, but he always tweets shit like, what I'm about to share is the most outrageous thing ever, you know? And then you're like, everyone's like, Ooh, pins and needles. What is it? And then you're like, that, that doesn't seem like it was that big a deal. He, he gets himself into trouble with that though. Sometimes because he had the tweet where he said, this is the, the biggest cheating scandal. It's bigger than Mike Postle. I know that. And one. then, and then it came out, it was someone playing on someone else's screen name. And it was like, Bill, look, it's not something that someone should be doing, but Mike Postle stared at his crotch for two years and won a quarter million dollars off of people at two five. I think, I think we got to put these in perspective. Exactly. <laughs> you know? yeah. these, are just, these are a little bit different. Um, yeah. So that I, I thought it, it was an interesting challenge. I, I'm actually, it's cool to see heads up is on a resurgence. And I think a lot of it is because we played this match. All of a sudden I just see heads up 
all over the place. Battles popping off. It's been I, good I for the game. Certainly, I think it certainly filled a void because like, I think like poker fans or people who love poker, right? For about a year, you know, there's nothing live. No, there's nothing new that was live, right? So stepped in and, you know, we had our thing, which people could watch and, you know, talk about things like that. And of course, online boom. But now with live back, I wonder... I also think too, like we've seen, you know, the emergence of Phil Ivy winning the, uh, you know, the heads up tournament and there's going to be like a hundred K at the end of the year, which I know both of us are going to play. So yeah, it's cool. Uh, like, actually, I, they, I was going to play it, but they changed the date and I, I can't do the new date. So I, I, I was going to play them though. Yeah, no, but I, I do think like, I think heads up tournaments are a lot of fun. Like, I think there's a lot of ways that you can market poker, especially with like heads up formats and brackets and things like that. You can even do a loser's bracket. There's just a lot, like when you think about creating a product, like a broadcast, you want things to talk about, right? That are outside of just the hands, right? So for the Poker Go Cup, you know, you can talk about, okay, well, Sam Soberall needs to come in second as long as McGrath doesn't come in third. Like anything additional you give the commentators as ammunition or like, you know, stuff to talk about is really good. And with heads up, there's so much, you know, like with matchups, like da da da, old school versus new school, battle of the streamers, you know, whatever, anything like that, I think is good. I agree. I, I think that the format is, it it lets you kind of build a story and it lets the viewer kind of hone in on people and, and a narrative that you kind of can't at a ring table. Usually at a ring table, the results, the way people view it is there's one to three people that they really want to see play and see how they play and watch their hands and stuff. Um, but then, you know, they fold and on the hand. And then I think even though it's obviously the most common horror poker and a lot of people are going to enjoy that, it doesn't let you sell the narrative in the same kind of juicy way that you can sell a heads up narrative. Heads up narratives can be awesome. They can be two guys that, you know, really dislike each other or two people from the same, you know, location battling it out for like supremacy or like whatever it is. Like it could be streamers. It could be, you know, Dan Smith played Steve Aoki. Aoki is playing from wh wherever, wherever in the world Aoki is in the, the recent heads up thing, whatever it is. And that tournament was cool too. It came down to Ivy and Helm or Ivy and uh, uh, Antonius. Right. Um, yeah. Ivy and Patrick. And you had to wonder what year is it? I'm watching Ivy. A lot and, of people and, were saying that. Yeah. Yeah. It, did you yeah. see those hands? There were some fun ones there. I saw the one where Phil just said, YOLO, fuck you, Chris. I'm going to just jam with nine. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. It raises the dudes on the plot. That was an interesting play. Um, yeah. That was both their parts. That was, that was some old school, some old school poker there. The taking to the streets. Deuces. The thing that Chris did on the flop, which I actually, so the thing that was like Chris raising on that flop, that's a thing that like for tournaments and short, I, I really like that play, but like everything fucking we did, like my guys kept hammering. Do not do that. Do not raise the flop too much. Because I think the difference is like when I was playing you, um, the idea behind it was like, if you're raising flops too often, then you're, you're just gutting your range that flats, you know, of too much stuff. But I, I really like it in tournaments where that doesn't matter as much and there's not as much balance. And that's one thing going back to Phil Helmuth, one thing he really does well in spots. Like in these tournaments, 50 blind Z, like you see bet the flop, he fucking bomb raises you on like King Jack four. Like that kind of like puts you in a spot where it's the old school, you know, phrase of like, he's finding out where he's at, but you really kind of do. Like if a guy has 45 bigs, you bet in bets the flop and you raise him with size and he continues on King Jack four, you just narrow. He doesn't, he doesn't have, he narrowed his range down significantly. Yeah. We, we played, a, we played some hands like that early on. And I think early on, actually, I remember we even talked about it a bit we had some funny sessions where we would play and then we would chat about hands and then we'd play again. So it was like, like we would talk about some of the, the hands that happened and like, I'd give you my thoughts, you give me your thoughts, whatever. And then I think there was a spot where you three bet the flop with top set or something early on. And then as the challenge went on, I feel like you really, you started trapping me way more in all of those spots where you kind of kept my range wider and, and let me I love, see like, yeah, that's the thing is cause I really wanted a raising range when you three bet and I flatted the button. Like I wanted a, I wanted a significant raising range. They didn't want me to have it. Like, yeah. Cause they're like, it's just not a thing, right? You can't raise this often or whatever. But like, I like the idea of, for example, you three bet and it comes like, you know, King seven deuce and then, uh, you know, raising flop with six, eight suited, which is like, you know, back three straight back door, you know, three flushes. Like I, re I really like that on the dry boards and different things like that. So, but again, I, I just, you know, yeah. we're trying to play as optimal as possible and solver is like, do not, that's not a thing too often. Uh, that strategy was especially bad, I think, versus me, because I think my theater range was a little more ace and king heavy than a lot of players. So um, I had a lot of top pairs in those spots. So if you start raising too much, yeah, you really, you really put me, if I have jacks, I'm going to eventually lose. I'm going to have to fold. But I have a bunch of, you know, king eight, king queen, king jack, some weeks, a few like king three, king four type hands. Then, 
you know, those hands just call because they're just hot pair, right? So y- y- while while it's nice to have in your bag of tricks and solvers do raise some, right? Solvers do some weird raises on those boards, by the way. Sometimes they'll raise, let's say it's king seven three, they're raising a seven some. Um, which I think I think the problem was the weight. So like what my guys taught me for the most part was like they asked why I thought something, and it was really the reasoning behind why I wanted to raise flops was broken because part of why I wanted to raise flops was a defense against you three bet, 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 betting. Right. And me being in tough spots there where you're like you bet flop, you bet turn and you bomb jam me all in on the river. Right. By raising flop, you know, I can sort of stop you from doing that, but it's not necessarily like a good thing. Right. And it also basically like my reasoning was like out of fear in a way. Right. So it's like out of like, fuck, I don't want to be in a tough spot with like, so for example, let's say it came King seven deuce and I have nines. Right want to raise the flop, find out where I'm at so that I don't have to call turn and then, you know, be on the river and maybe you bluff me, maybe you don't like, cause that is a kind of a tough spot. When you three yeah. bet, you have nines, let's say I flat it, comes king seven deuce, you bet, turns a four, you bet, and the river's like a, a jack and now you just jam. Like You're gonna, you're gonna lose, you're gonna lose there. I mean, you get the fold, right? Yeah. Whereas if you raise flop, you know, I, I felt like I could stop you from doing that. And, you know, based on learning more about it, it's like, it's just not in theory, like a really good idea. Cause I'm, yeah, it's just not a good idea. Th- then the problem becomes though I can start bet three betting, and then and then yeah. I have all these good hands you don't have, and then it gets it just puts you. Yeah, I felt you. like you did that a couple times later when I when I was like I because I, I at one point I'm like I want to raise flops, I want to have a raising range in these spots, and then I did that for like I don't know two three sessions. Then you started three betting flops. I'm like fuck. Okay, I see why I can't do that no more. <laughs> you, you did a lot of turn raising in those spots too. It was it was actually c betting the turn to get pots versus you was really difficult because you didn't fold. I think your fold was, I want to say it was very low there. I want to say it was 20 over 30. And at one point you were jamming one out of every four or five turn bets. You were just jamming over the top of it. And some of them were, were hands that I really didn't want to jam. Like there was like a, a weak top pair. I think it was like a queen, queen high board. Three. I remember watching yeah. the video where you went. Yeah, that was early on though. That yeah, was yeah, yeah. Like I was like, yeah, that, I, was, I, got, I got blasted for that one. Yeah, okay. <laughs> what okay. are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Well, because I mean, but it does make it hard to bet the turns. I had some really difficult spots with draws where it's like you would normally just bet and not worry about it. But then when you're jamming that much, you're thinking, oh God, I don't want to fight. And then I, I definitely had some flush draws. I went bet, bet, get jammed on. I just puke and have to fold my flush <laughs> draw. The, the, those suck. Um, but but yeah, you just get stacked too much, you know, when, when they, so there was, a, there was like, there was for me when I got behind, that's actually, that happened a lot more when I got behind in the match. Cause part of what I was, part of my theory was I was trying to increase variance in the turn. Right. And one of the things that I was doing was like, those were, those, those turn jams or turn raises were very bluff heavy, they, but they were not just random YOLO bluffs. They were like gut shot flush draw. They were like, you know, bottom pair flush draw type hands where I had like, you know, if you called, you know, I'm like, whatever, maybe 30, 34% equity. But if you fold, you know, fantastic. Yeah, it gets weird with side bets. That's And that's why when I was going through some of these hands and I'm just like, you know, reviewing them, I, I was like, well, you have to think about maybe he's trying to create variance here to win side bets and stuff because the reach points where you are incentivized to jam your draw because then if you win, great, obviously. And then if I do call, well, now your your chance of winning the challenge actually increases even though your, your chip EV decreases, which... Seems like every situation you get into is like that. You have a difference between your chip EV and your results, your dollar EV. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, it's hard when you get in those spots, right? Sometimes you have to make some decisions that... Um, right, that's where the side bets fuck you up, right? Because, yeah. like, like, you know, I talked to my guy and I was like, so that's what I want to do is like, I want to increase variance. He's like, okay, you realize though, like by you increasing variance, it's going to cost you like, you know, theory, theoretical dollars, right? Yeah, I yeah. Like, yeah, I get it, but I think it's worth it to... Because I, I wanted to win the match. Like, obviously, for both of us, I'm assuming for you too, like, the results financially were not going to change my life either way. For me, I, I, <laughs> I, okay, maybe, uh, <laughs> for me, I was okay either way. And so, like, for me, it was like, what I basically, for me, it was like, it's almost like in, in, it's a hockey analogy where what, what gives me the best chance to win? If I'm down three nothing in the third period, right? And there's 15 minutes left, pull the fucking goal. Just pull the goalie and go YOLO. So I was trying to think of ways that would increase variance so that I could like give myself a better chance to win. That was it. Like, what is the best way to win? What is it? What is, what gives me the highest percentage chance to win? And it was certainly on turns to get it in, in spots where either you fold or I get it in, you know, 35, 40% equity for heaps where all of a sudden, you know, if we get two and a half buy-ins each, you know, that, that, that can, uh, basically depending on a little bit of luck. Yeah. That one day was scary, man. 
That one day where you just just ripped me for ten buy-ins or whatever. Well, that's when you came back on the Monday, fucking deep limp. I, like, fuck. <laughs> I, I I had I had worked so hard to build a lead and I lost almost half the lead in one session. It was a 10 by and loss. Yeah. And and also what, what what especially hurt about that one was there was I mean there was some coolers, don't get me wrong, but I probably if I had played correctly, I should have lost like six or seven in that range. One of them was kind of close. There was two to three just just punts. I just punted off some some calls and it wasn't even I was making calls that you know, cause a lot, of, I, I felt this pressure from a lot of people where they're like just fold versus Daniel. He's just under bluffing you everywhere. And I, and I just had to, I don't play like that guys. Like I'm just, I, I, yeah. I don't play in that fashion. So, you know, it, it doesn't well, there matter. Were, how- there were spots where we talked, there were spots where I certainly started to under bluff because you fucking made some calls that were bonkers. Like early on, like you called me with deuces or no, you called me with ace king oh, high. Yeah. I remember that. Hand. You called me with ace king without a diamond on three, four, five, six, nine with fucking diamonds when I bet turned and jammed the river with deuces and you called him ace king high. I was like, this guy's fucking nuts. Right? You were so hoping to own me there with like, where I just had like the queen jack with a diamond or something. So early on in matches though, I usually like to call yeah. a bit light, just to see what's going on and, and get data and, and also just establish, let the tone be set a little bit of yeah. look like everyone always gets a bluff, bluff student heads up. Obviously you can't stop all the bluffs. But it's going to be difficult, <laughs> and I just want it to be known very early here. If you if you think you're going to get many gloves through, well, the message it's going to be hard. Loud and clear that you're like you don't enjoy folding. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's that's definitely that's definitely true. And and but that session specifically, I had some really bad calls that were just bad. I mean, I ran them, and they, this is a bad call. This is a bad call, and I I don't think it was tilt because I I don't really think I tilt. I just think that my baseline is a little bit too loose on, on calling. And I think that that session, I had a lot of spots where you had good hands and I had a hand that was in the, in the ballpark of considering a call. And I just kind of, and there was some RNG stuff too. And and that, and the, but in that session too, I remember part of it was like trying to increase variance, but part of it was trying to take advantage of that was I upped my sizing on a lot of those spots. Like instead of betting like two thirds, I was betting full pot. And I was, so basically I was taking a lot more value into the big sizing because you, you know, you were calling quite often in those spots. So I was like, fuck it. If he's going to call, let's get max, you know? Yeah. And then they, things changed on the Monday where you, you and your guys were like, fuck you, dude, stop calling him or you're going to have to limp. <laughs> have to limp the button. I mean, and I know you don't want to. <laughs> yeah. That, that was, that was a low, it was a low day for me. It was a, a low day for you too. I think, I think we can just, we can put that one safely in the past <laughs> yeah, sure. uh, at this point. Okay, so I think I think we're we're uh, right about at the end of things here. Um, I had a few last Twitter questions that I wanted just to run through quickly. Um, there's a couple questions here from Alex Alec, Alexander Bunin online, and uh, he wanted to know. He asked a few questions, but he wanted to know what's your goal for right now, poker wise, and how are you working on it? Well, the truth is, I'm actually looking for new ways because the guys that I work with for most of my years, the guys over you know the hybrid guys, they like we worked on 100 big blind, deep stack, no limit poker, mostly heads up, but I can extrapolate very easily, you know, to cash, right? What I haven't worked on and I don't have a good grasp of, I actually, I have a good intuitive grasp because I've been playing tournaments for so long, is like 40 big blinds or less, like these key spots, ICM. Learning, ICM, learning more about ICM, not because I'm worried about it, but to understand the pressure that I can put on players who are, right? like understand how wide, much wider I can open my ranges. So I'm kind of in the process of thinking about like maybe who I want to work with on that. Um, Cause I do think like, I'm always learning. Like I always, like I got better as our challenge went and I'm, I'm thankful for the fact that like I, it was, it forced me to get better. Like I lost money, but people are, Oh, it didn't, you know, like I said, it was 30 buy-ins such as like sometimes you lose, but I did get better and I always want to get better in terms of poker. Um, you know, I definitely like want to win that world series poker player of the year thing again. Cause I did win it three times, but then lost it and won it. So I'm a former three time world series poker champ, player of the year champ. I do want to get that number three. And I feel like in that race, you know, there's a small group of people like Sean Deeb is probably like my biggest uh, adversary in that in terms of like, you know, because he plays all the games well, you know, and, and, and just in life general, now that we're, friends or, or whatever we're I at get along I, fine with Sean. okay we're fine now i think i think so i, I reached out to him i said you know i'm a, if, it's, if it's good with you I'm, I'm good to just throw the shit in the back and he said okay so i speak to him normally now too 
but yeah, World Series of Poker is a big one. Obviously, I'm going to be playing these online, WSOP.com. So I'm going to play the GG Series. I'm going to travel to Cabo, which really sucks. The fact that I have to travel to Cabo. Like, if, you know, if I wasn't me, right, and I wasn't Daniel Negreanu, ambassador for GG Poker, you know, maybe I would put a backdrop up of a beach <laughs> you know, right here or something like that and be like, welcome to Cabo here. You know what I mean? Like, but obviously in I, theory, in, in hy- yeah, hypothetically, I don't give a right? shit personally. I don't give a shit what couch people play from. I never did, whether I was with a company or not. Um, I don't think it's a thing. I don't think, as long as people are playing on their own account, I don't give a shit where they're playing from personally. Um, but so I'll be traveling to Cabo for that. Then the poker masters, then we got super high roller bowl again. I'm really looking forward to that because one of the things that I found was the work that I did in playing against you, uh, in the heads up again, I said, I extrapolated really, really helped me against these top killers, deep stack. Like I really felt like I had a significant advantage when we were hundred big wines deep against some really, really good players. Right. And I, I'm not taking anything away from, them. I think they're like top notch, but I really felt very confident in my, in my, in my, in what I was doing. Like I, a lot of the same stuff I was doing against you doing against them it just worked really, really well. Like, especially in position. Like I felt like against you, I was a lot better or it was a lot more, I got a lot better at playing in position faster than out of position, you know, and in tournaments, a lot of the time when you're the one raising, you're going to be in position in similar spots. So looking forward to the super high rollable because that is deep stack gives you a lot of time. And I've had good success in that over the years. So for me, it's just like, you know, it's just going to be tournaments. I don't have any heads up challenges, you know, on the, on the horizon kind of fucking over that chapter for a little while. Maybe we'll get back into those streets in another day. Well, a, a high up member at GG, I don't want to say his name because I, I'll, I'll message you after privately. He took the time to message me the other day and he said, hey, I just want you to know this wasn't a GG poker thing. We didn't launch it uh, according to Doug attack. We did a video with Bolzerian and a Bolzerian like talk some shit about me or whatever. And then Bryn the next day, like he's like talking some shit. He's, I just wanted to be clear. This wasn't a company direction. I'm like, OK, well, Bryn's not with the company. So, oh, well, <laughs> Bryn is not. He's not. With the company. OK, well, Bryn then they. <laughs> Either I said, look, man, I, I really don't care if, if Bulzarian and Bryn want to make fun of me. Have at it. It's not gonna, not gonna yeah. upset me. Um, but uh, who knows? Maybe I have some heads up challenges in the horizon. Y- you never really know these days. Yeah, who knows? Okay, uh, I think that's it. Is, unless there's anything else you want to talk about here, any last subjects, Daniel? I want to say thanks for coming on the pod today. Okay, I have one question for you. Okay. So, and this is because I, I have a theory and I have a guess, right? So you're doing well now financially. Things are good. You moved to Austin, right? Moved to Austin, correct. Yep. Happy there. So why do you do podcasts, videos? Why do you do YouTube stuff? Like what is the main real driver behind it? Because I know you quit for a while and you were right. done, retired, and now you're back to it. What brought you back and why, why are you doing it? So the main thing that, to be, to be totally honest with you, what I one of my favorite things is making people laugh and giving and sort of the happiness that I see from people when they enjoy the content. And like, I think the best example is if I do a video and I have a really funny bit in there and then just seeing the, the community, I, I find it really rewarding to, to, to get that experience. And, and I also, I like having a voice in the community. I like being able to express my thoughts and talk about things that are important to me. And then there are also obviously business upsides, you know, I get to promote my company. I, I get to you know, there, there are indirect ways I'll make money from it as well. But I think, I think that the, the biggest thing for me is just to get that interaction with the community. I, I love it, man. I, I love seeing what, what I love it when people get to respond and see the content and, and, and it, it's so authentic. It's so honest when you see what people have to say, sometimes I'll do bits and I'll think that they're amazing. And then the responses will just be, and you're like, Oh man, I thought that that was going to be good. Like a great example of this. I went to, um, I went to uh, Pittsburgh to, Basically, there was a, a bot challenge where the CMU guys, the AI guys, they were playing the humans and I'm friends with all the that. humans. Okay, I did this Coach Doug thing where I went there and I pretended to be the coach, right? And I was so proud of it, man. I mean, I flew to a fucking city. Hold, hold on. Watched it. Do, do, you, do you realize how big, of, how much work went in this? I flew to the city. I had to get a pass. I had, I brought Thomas with me. We did all these planned out scenes. We did the whole thing. It took days of editing. We're talking a full week of just all in on this thing. And I posted it. And the, the first response is like, is it just me or is Doug really fucking fat right now? And someone's like, yeah, he really is. And then like, I'm just, to my horror, it's just hundreds of fat comments coming in. And I'm thinking, oh man, this is, this is just brutal. And then, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a popular video. I, I really was proud of it, but you know, then it wasn't, 
it was it's it's it, there's an uh, there's an authenticness an authenticity to the feedback that's just great and then when you have those moments the other way where you put something out um and people really enjoy it like i did a video on vanessa selps top five punts people have loved that video for basically forever and, and the point is when you get that feedback i really love that um so i'd say that was that's the the biggest driving factor for me it's funny you say that last part because i there was a woman i used to speak to many years ago she was like a you know smart therapist type lady and uh, she was talking about me being more creative and doing some creative things, whatever. And I was like, oh yeah, I think people would like that or this, right? And she said, what you want to do is, because like, it sounds like you really love this video, right? You love the video up until people didn't love it as much as you did. And then it sort of affected your view of the, like, the content. Because you, like, you really enjoyed the content. You enjoyed making the content. But then it, it feels as though sometimes like the public, if, if so basically, like, I guess the, the point is the journey should be like, in enjoying the process of making it more so than what people are going to think. Just, just to jump in really quick. Basically, I don't like it when it becomes the grind of having to do it. Like on this platform, if you want to be really successful, you have to post constantly all the time and you have to do a lot of content that, that you don't enjoy. And I think, I think that that kind of killed the spark, right? Because the top 10, 15, 20% of content that I made, I loved it. But then there's this bottom 50 or 75% where it just gets to be a grind. I don't know if you followed much back in the day, but I post a video every day. So every single day I post something. And a lot of that stuff was stuff, frankly, I don't give a fuck about. I, I, it, was, it was, should this guy with pocket tens call the turn? I mean, look, I did it for the beginners and it's probably still my most popular content type. You were to- doing it at the time like that because you wanted to build a brand and be successful right. and you know, promote a bunch of stuff. But like now- you have the luxury of, I mean, I would, this is why I sort of asked the question because I'm like, you don't really have to do this shit no more, but you do it. And now you get the opportunity of doing it because you can do stuff that you just enjoy doing and you can cut out all the rest. That does, that means you're not going to be doing a video every day but when you feel like doing something, you do it. And I think I can relate to you in that way because I still do a podcast myself. I still do these old school, new school videos and things like that. Cause I find, I like doing them. I'm enjoy, I enjoy them. I, I had to avoid reading the comments for a little while after our match and fucking Phil like I literally, one of the best things I ever did was ban myself from Twitter for a week after the, I couldn't, it was like so much, I didn't see any of it. So all the shade and all the heat that people threw at me, they were probably so happy about, Ooh, I stung them with this. Didn't see none of it. So, so that was like really nice. It's really <laughs> tough. How, how do you, how do you strike the balance there? Because for me, what I find is when the internet starts talking about you on something, I feel like if you start reading comments, it's hard to stop reading them. You end up reading every comment everyone says. And so there's there's a real balancing act there on you don't want to be oblivious to what people think, but then you also don't want to become obsessed with it. And so there's a real art there in trying to find that balance. What do you think about, uh, what are your thoughts so on that's that that's valuable. Like I've always been looking, I've been reading, you know, forums and stuff like that for many, many years in poker. And part of the reason, like you said, is you get to get a sense of like how people perceive you, right? So like if you're trying to project something and you're like, oh, um, this is what people are going to, and then they're all receiving it in a different way. If they're all receiving it that way, then you have to look deeper and like, well, maybe it's me. If you don't, if it's a couple dumb comments here and there, you're like, all right, whatever, Just who cares? You know, whatever you have to say. But sometimes there's value in that. And yeah, I, I feel like I've gotten more experience in poker at that than anybody in terms of like being in the limelight and uh, being attacked for whatever, for righteous reasons. People do that? No way. <laughs> sometimes for good reason, sometimes, you know, not. But um, I've had a lot of experience at like getting to the point that like, okay, this person who just said this doesn't even know me, right? We've never had a beer together. We've never spent any time together. They're having this opinion about mob mentality. It's like, ultimately, like I look at my life and, you know, Brian actually sent me this. It's like, after, he's like, dude, you won. It's like, I won because I've been in love with this girl that I'm married to. For, oh, I think there was a bet on how many times I would mention Amanda. So on, on, on one of the comments, someone said that. I'm going to mention her once. But like when I think about my life that I've created, right? Like I did marry my dream girl. Like I live in a great place. I'm financially okay. So like if I'm obsessing over Bob 317996 saying I'm a fucking loser, vegan idiot, bald, whatever, like then, it really, then I'm really not like having my focus in the right place. I laugh at most of it, right? Like most of it I can laugh at. What annoys me, the stuff that annoys me is when people say things factual, like as a fact that are just not true. Like that's not fucking true though. You know, like that shit pisses me off, but it shouldn't because it's like, whatever, people are going to do that. And I, the problem I, with when people say things that are not true, here's the thing. If you ignore it, then it becomes the truth, right? But if you address it, then you get involved in the back and forth, which is the worst possible poison for me. 
is getting involved in Twitter back and forth. You know, where like you're trying to, like the whole fucking points thing, that one was driving me up the wall. Where, where like I won the World Series Poker Player of the Year, right? Then like a week later, they said there was a miscount. And then there's this whole theory about, ooh, Daniel fucking tried to steal it because he knew the points. I'm like, you gotta be fucking kidding me with this. Cause then, and then I literally went down a fucking myriad of evidence to suggest that I didn't, you know? And I obviously didn't, but whatever. That shit pisses me off because that's questioning, that's questioning my inter- integrity on a very deep level, you know? Saying like, well, we'll never know. I'm like, fuck you, man. I've got 30 years in this. You can say a lot of things about me. But one thing you can say is like, I don't cheat at things. I don't cheat at anything in poker and I don't cheat at something that pays exactly zero dollars and zero cents for pride. You know what I mean? Like that. So that's the kind of stuff when my, when my integrity is questioned stuff, that it's like, it's hard to ignore that shit. You know, I know exactly what you're saying. I mean, I, so I, I've, so my, my take has always been to just get right involved in the back and forth and just punch back, which has overall gone pretty well for me. I, I've taken a few L's along the way, but usually I just get in the mix. And when people, when people say stuff that insults me, it's, I, I, I have pretty thick skin. But when people say things that are just lies, an example would be like um, Luke Schwartz when he's upswing's a scam. They they're not they're not actually teaching anything. They're just scamming. It's no, we're not a scam. You can hate me. You can you think I'm a dick, whatever. But we are a, a legitimate good training site. You know things. Like, I had to work one more plug, one, one for the road. And no, I'm just kidding. But stuff like that where it's where people attack kind of who you are and with with things that are not true. That that does that does. I mean, it hurts because it's not it's not true about you. You know, someone's saying something that's not true and they're using that to attack you. So I, I, I can totally, I totally know where you're coming from on that. Like imagine someone saying to you that you think that more rake would be better. Are you fucking crazy? I don't think anyone would do that. Who would think? I, I, I don't think that, no. Imagine fucking spending $5,000 on a billboard that you put outside the fucking Rio. To let- <laughs> okay, let's start How with the billboard it? for one 5, second. 5,000, right? It was about 5,000. That's actually strangely accurate. Uh, <laughs> Wow, that was actually really good. I think it was fifty four hundred or something like that. Um, have you? Wait, do you have billboard experience? I actually no, but I didn't even. You okay. know, I never. I didn't drive in that way, so I didn't see the billboard outside of like pictures that people sent me and go, "Look at that! That's the fucking." Because I never went in the front. But. I saw. I saw some theories uh, from people who watched your vlog that you drove a different way to the Rio because of the billboards. That's not true. I see. That's another thing. That's. Com- I was, I parked in the back, right? Okay. So like, I always took that back way regardless. It wasn't like, oh "Oh my God, I can't walk. I can't drive by the billboard to keep my composure. So (laughs) when we had that kind of confrontation at um, the Super High Roller Bowl, you already knew it was coming. And there was a really small group of people that knew. So we both know it was Stapes, right? We we're both we both are aware that Stapes I do was not. Rem- I swear to you. Okay. Gen- it could be. I swear to you. I don't. I don't know who it was. Such I a small group, though. Such but there was a, small a couple group. people. There was more than one person who told me that it was coming. Okay. More than one person, for sure. It was more than one person who let me know that it was coming. Hmm, okay. Yeah. Had to be Stapes. I'm telling you. I'm calling it. If I oh, if I could if I super high when you took the shirt. I mean, I fucking assumed that was coming. Like, oh, oh, maybe it was before that. You knew it was coming, though. You, you, you had heard it through the the grapevine that the, the billboard was on. I mean, it, it was a pretty funny billboard, right? It was. Oh, I. You know what? No, I definitely heard it from several people. Okay. Yeah, several people. All right, well, we got some we got some leaky ships over here at Pulled News Productions. <laughs> We're gonna have to do an internal investigation. <laughs> Fire some people. Yeah. Um. It, it, it was, it was, uh, it was 5k. It was, it was 5k well spent though. It was f- for the lulls, man. It was, it was some good lulls. Definitely. It was definitely good for lulls. I, like, I had a lot of lull ideas, but like, you know, well, when we played our first one, I told you about that one, I think like, cause with the whole pre-flop chart thing, yeah. ah, chart charts, like my plan or I thought about it was like, if I beat you in a big pot and stack you, which is like to have a sh- fucking pre-flop chart that goes, Hey, you know, in case you need these, let's get a throw them I, 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 I thought that would have been amazing. Yeah. That would actually, that would have been, you should, you should have done that. Although I think at that point it, we had taken a turn of where we're going to keep it pretty respectful. At least I think, I think by. I still think that you would have laughed at. Yeah. Know. That's, I mean, that that's not insulting, you know, that, that, that would have been just, but I think like at that point in time, ne- neither person wanted to seem like they were trying to be offensive. And I actually, I saw a lot of people that were upset on our, our live match that oh, where's the shit talking Dude, you're you're sitting with one person for four or five hours, just you and them. You, you think that the whole time is gonna be yeah, fuck you, man. Okay, here's your hand. Yeah. You look at me. That's well, so yeah, awkward. I feel like I feel like there's there had been plenty of shit talk 
leading up to it that it was like uh, more needs to be said we're gonna regurgitate the same shit you know absolutely absolutely all right that's that's it for the day thank you for coming on i appreciate it cheers man have a good one that's going to be a wrap for us today guys and if you enjoyed this episode make sure to subscribe you can do so either on youtube or on your podcast platform of choice we are now up on all of the big ones so you can subscribe and make sure to not miss an episode as well as get notified for when our new episodes become available we're going to be focused mainly on crypto or mainly on poker and gambling stuff, but we'll be talking some crypto as well. In fact, later this week, we're going to be joined by Jason Les to discuss Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. If you're not familiar with Jason, he is the CEO of Riot Blockchain, a multi billion dollar company, and also one of my very good friends. You know, believe it or not, at one point, I used to coach Jason. How times change. Anyway, we'll be joined by Jason, and that should be a great one, a little bit different than what we've been doing so far. We've got a few other guests in the pipeline as well, so make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. I'll see you guys again later this week.